Good morning. Oh. Good morning. Sorry, my microphone is fucked up. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I mean, yeah, it's almost close to noon now. Anyway, good morning. Hello. Nice to meet you. Anyway. Finally back with Nudible. I've been busy with life and also uh, some raiding. I, I mean, I'm not like super hardcore raiding or anything like that. Just catching up on raiding content and just fucking around, basically. Yeah. Uh, so sorry for uh, the <laughs> postponing the last part of Never Let Me Go for like two weeks. Um, I do apologize for that, but. Here we are today. We're gonna start now. Um, there isn't people here yet, so that's fine. We can just uh, straight up start reading the book now and not waste too much time talking about nonsense. Basically, yep. Wait, let me check my viewer rewards. <laughs> I don't want you guys to be spamming shit. Uh, What's all good? Good morning, my Holly Wing. Good morning. Hey, glad to see you here this morning. So sorry, I haven't been doing new debugs for a bit. <sighs> like I said earlier, been busy with doing nonsense, <sighs> like living a life, kind of trying to live a life. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, today we are going to. Uh, finish up today we are going to finish up never let me go part three the, there's not much left so it's definitely doable to finish up the entire book today uh, I'm glad to separate it into three parts actually they are like just right I think the first part was a bit longer than the others can you guys hear me fine? Alright. Without further ado, let's, let's continue. Never let me go. Part 3, Chapter 18. <laughs> For the most part, being a carer's Suit, suited me fine. You could even say it's brought the best out of me. But some people just aren't cut out for it. And for them, the whole thing becomes a real struggle. They might start off positively enough, but then comes all that time spent so close to the pain and the worry, and sooner or later a donor doesn't make it, even though, say, it's only their second donation, and no one anticipated complications. When a donor completes like that, out of the blue, it doesn't make much difference what the nurses say to you afterwards, and neither does the letter saying how they are sure you did all you could and to keep up the good work. For a while at least, you are demoralized. Some of us learn pretty quick how to deal with it, but for the others, like Laura, say, they never do. Then there's the solitude. You grow up surrounded by crowds of people. That's all you have ever known. And suddenly you are a carer. You spend hour after hour on your own driving across the country, center to center, hospital to hospital, sleeping in overnight. No one to talk about, about your worries. No one to have a laugh with. Just now and again, you run into an old student you know, a carer or, the, or a donor you recognize from the old days, but they're never much time. 
you're always in a rush, or else you're too exhausted to have a proper conversation. Soon enough, the long hours, the traveling, the broken sleep have all crept into your being and become part of you so everyone can see it in your posture, your gaze, the way you move and talk. I don't claim I've been immune to all of this but I've learned to live with it. Some carers though, their whole attitude lets them down. A lot of them, you can tell, are just going through the motions, waiting for the day they are told they can stop and become donors. It really gets me, too, the way so many of them shrink the moment they step inside a hospital. They don't know what to say to the white coats. They can't make themselves speak up on behalf of their donor. No wonder they end up feeling frustrated and blaming themselves when things go wrong. I tried not to make a nuisance out of myself, but I figured out how to, to get my voice heard when I have to. And when things go badly, of course, I'm upset. But at least I can feel I've done all I could and keep things in perspective. Even in the solitude, I've actually grown to quite, even the solitude, I've actually grown to quite like. That's not to say I'm not looking forward to a bit more companionship come the end of the year when I'm finished with, with all of this. But I do like the feeling of getting into my little car, knowing for the next couple of hours I'll have only the roads and the big gray, and the big gray sky and my daydreams for company. And I'm in, and if I'm in, in a town somewhere with several minutes to kill, I'll enjoy myself wandering about, looking in the shop windows, here. In my bed seat, I've got these four desk lamps, each a different color, but all of them the same design. They have these rib necks you can bend whichever way you want, so I might go looking for a shop with another lamp like that in its window, not to buy, but just to compare with my ones at home. Sometimes I get so immersed in my own company, if I unexpectedly run into someone I know, it's a bit of a shock and takes me a while to adjust. That's the way it was the morning I was walking across the windswept car car park of the service station and spotted Laura sitting behind the wheel of one of the parked cars looking vacantly towards the motorway. I was still some way away and just for a second, even though we hadn't met since the cottages seven years before, I was tempted to ignore her and kept walking. An odd reaction I know, considering she has been one of my closest friends, as I say, it may have been partly because I didn't like to being bummed out of my daydreams. But also, I suppose when I saw Laura slumped in her car like that, I saw immediately she had become one of those carers I have been just des describing. And a part of me just didn't want to find out much more about it. But of course, I did go to her. There was a chilly wind blowing against me as I walked over to her hatchback parked away from the other vehicles. Laura was wearing a shapeless blue anorak, and her hair, a lot shorter than before, was sticking to her forehead. When I tap on when I tap on her windows, she didn't start or even look surprised to see me after all that time. It was almost like she had been sitting there waiting, if not for me precisely, then for someone more or less like me from the old days. And now I had shown up. Her first thought seemed to be, at last. Because I could see her shoulders move in a kind of sigh, then without further ado, she reached over to open the door for me. We talked about, we talked for about 20 minutes, I didn't leave until the last possible moment. A lot of it was about her, how exhausted she has been, how difficult one of her donors was, and how much she loathed this nurse or that doctor. I waited to see a flash of the old Laura with the, mis with the mis mischievous grin and inevitable wisecrack, but none of that came. She talked faster than she used to, and although she seemed pleased to see me, I sometimes get the got the impression it wouldn't have mattered much if it wasn't me, but someone else, so long as she got to talk. Maybe we both felt there was something dangerous about bringing up the old days, because for ages, we avoided any mention of it. In the end, though, we found ourselves talking about Ruth and 
who Laura had lot, who Laura had run into a clinic a few years earlier, when Ruth was still a carer. I was quizzing her about Ruth, about how Ruth had been, but she was so unforthcoming. In the end, I said to her, "Look, you must have talked about something." Laura let out a sigh. "You know how it gets," she said. We were both in a hurry. Then she said, "Anyway, we hadn't parted the best of friends back at the cottages, so maybe we weren't so delighted to see each other." I didn't realize you had fallen out with her too. I said. She shrugged. It wasn't any a big deal. You remember the way she was back then. If anything, after you left, she got worse. You know, always telling everyone what to do. So I was keeping out of her way. That was all. We never had a big fight or anything. So, you haven't seen you haven't seen her since then, right? No. Funny, but I've never even glimpsed her. Yeah, it's funny. You would think we'll all run into each other much more. I've seen Hannah a few times and Michael H too. Then she said, "I heard this rumor that Ruth had a really bad first donation. Just a rumor, but I heard it more than once." I heard that too. I said, "Poor Ruth." We were quite we were quiet for a moment. Then Laura asked, "Is it right, Kathy?" That they let you choose your donors now. She had not asked in the accusing way people do sometimes, so I nodded and said, "Not every time, not every time." But I did well with a few donors, so yeah, I get to say, I get to have a say every now and then. If you can choose, Laura said, "Why don't you become Ruth's carer?" I shrugged. I've thought about it, but I'm not so sure if if it's such a good idea. Laura looked puzzled, but you and Ruth—you were so close. Yeah, I suppose so. But like you, Laura, she and I weren't such great friends by the end. Oh, but that was then. She's had a bad time, and I've heard she had trouble with her carers too. They have been—they have had to change them around a lot for her. Not surprising, really. I said. Can you imagine being Ruth's carer? Laura laughed, and for a second, she looked. A look came into her eyes, and made me think she she was finally going to come out with a crack. But then, the light died, and she just went on sitting there looking tired. We talked a little more about Laura's problem, in particular with a certain nursing sister who seemed to have it in for her. Then, it was time for me to go, and I reached for the door, and was telling her. We would have to talk more the next time we meet, but we were that we were both of us by then acutely aware of something we had not met had had not yet mentioned, and I think we both sense there would be something wrong about us parting like that. In fact, I'm pretty sure now. At that moment, our minds were running along exactly the same lines. Then she said, "It's weird, thinking it's all gone now." I turned in. My seat to face her again. Yeah, it's really strange. I said, I can't believe it's not there anymore. It's weird, Laura said. I know. I su I suppose it shouldn't make any difference to me now, but somehow it does. I know what you mean. It was that exchange when we finally mentioned the closing of Hailsham that suddenly brought us to close together again, and we hugged. Quite spontaneously, not so much to comfort one another, but as a way of affirming Hailsham, the fact that it was there for, it was there in both of our memories. Then, I had to hurry off to my car. I at first started hearing rumors about Hailsham closing a year or so before that meeting with Laura in the car park. I had been talking to a donor or carer, and they were bringing up, in passing, that they expected me to know all about it. You were at Hailsham, weren't you? So is it true? That sort of thing. Then one day, I was coming out of the clinic in Su at Suffolk, in Suffolk. Sorry. Then one up. Then one day, I was coming out of a clinic in Suffolk, and ran into Roger C, who had been in the year below, and he told me with a complete certainty that it was about to happen. Hailsham was going to close any day, and there were plans to sell the house and the grounds to a hotel chain. 
I remember my first response when he told me this. I said, "But what will happen to all the students?" Roger obviously thought I would add men to one still there, the little ones dependent on their on their guardians, and he put a troubled face and began speculating how they would have to be transferred to other houses across the country, even though some of these would be a far cry from Hailsham. But of course, that wasn't what I had meant. I had meant us. All the students who had grown up with me, and were now spread across the country, carers and donors, all separated now, but still somehow linked by the place we had come from. That same night, trying to get asleep, trying to get sleep in an overnight, I kept thinking about something that had happened to me a few days earlier. I had been in a seaside town in North Wales. It had been raining hard all morning, but after lunch. It stopped, and the sun had come out a bit. I was walking back to where I had left my car along one of those long, straight seafront roads. There was hardly anyone else about, so I could see an unbroken line of wet paving stones stretching on in front of me. Then, after a while, a van pulled up, maybe thirty yards ahead of me, and a man got out dressed as a clown. He opened the back of the van and took out a bunch of helium balloon balloons, about a dozen of them. And for a moment, he was holding the balloons in one hand, while he bent down and rummaged about in his vehicles with the with the other. As I came closer, I could see the balloons had faces and shaped ears, and they looked like little tripe bobbing in the air above the owner, waiting for him. Then the clown straightened, closed up his van, and started walking in the. In the same direction I was walking, several paces ahead of me, a small suitcase in one hand and the balloons on the other. The seafront continued long and straight, and I was walking behind him for what seems like ages. Sometimes I felt awkward about it, and I even thought the clown might turn and say something. But since that was the the way I had to go, there wasn't much else I could do, so we just kept kept walking. The clown and me. On and on along the de desert, the deserted pavement, still wet from the morning, and all this, all the time the balloons were bumping and grinding down at me. Every so often, I could see the man's fist where all the balloon strings converged, and I could see he had them secured, twisted together in a tight grip. Even so, I kept worrying that one of the strings would come unraveled and a single balloon would sail off. Up into the cloudy sky, lying awake that night after what Roger had told me, I kept seeing those balloons. Now, I thought about Hailsham closing, and how it was like someone coming along with a pair of scissors and snipped the balloon strings just where they entwined above the man's fist. Once that happened, there would be no real, new, no real sense in which those balloons belong with each other anymore. When he was telling me the news about Hailsham, Roger had made a remark saying that he was su he supposed it wouldn't make so, so much of a difference to the like of us anymore. And in certain ways, he might have been right, but it was unnerving to think things weren't still going on back there. Just as always, the people like Miss Jardine say weren't leading groups of juniors around the north playing field. In the months after that talk with Roger, I kept thinking about it a lot, about Hailsham closing and all the implications, and it started to to dawn on me. I suppose there are a lot of things that I had uh, always assumed I had plenty of time to get around to doing. I might now have to act on pretty soon, or else let them go forever. It's not that I started to panic exactly, but. It definitely felt like Hailsham is going away and had shifted everything around us. That's why, what Laura said to me that day about my becoming Ruth's carer had such an impact on me. Even though I had stonewalled her at that time, it was almost like a part of me had already made that decision, and Laura's word had simply pulled away away a veil that had been covering it over. I first turned up at Ruth's re Ruth's recovery center. In Dover, the modern one with the white tiled walls, just a few weeks after the talk with Laura. It had been around two months since Ruth's first donation, which, as Laura had said, hadn't gone at at all well. 
When I came to her room, she was sitting on the edge of her bed with her nightdress and gave me a big smile. She got up to give me a hug but almost immediately sat down again. She told me I was looking better than ever and that my hair suited me really well. I said nice things to her, uh, about her too. And for the next half hour or so, I think we were genuinely delighted to be with each other. We talk about, we talk about all kinds of different things. Hailsham, the cottages, and what we had been doing since then. And it felt like we could talk and talk forever. In other words, it was really encourage, it was a really encouraging start. Better than, than I ex- better than I dared expect. Even so, that first time we didn't say anything about the way we had parted. Maybe if we didn't maybe if we had tackled it at the start, things would have played out differently. But who knows? As it was, we just skip it over and once we had been talking for a while, it was as if we had agreed to pretend none of that had ha- ever happened. That may have been fine as far as the first meeting was concerned. But once I officially became her carer and I began to see her regularly, the sense of something not being right grew stronger and stronger. I developed a routine of coming in three or four times a week in the afternoon with mineral water and a packet of her favorite biscuits and it should be and it should have been wonderful. But at the beginning it was anything but that. We would start talking about something, something completely innocent, and for no obvious reason, we had come to a halt. Or if we did manage to keep up a conversation, the longer we went on, the more stilted and guarded it became. Then one afternoon, I was coming down her corridor to see her and heard someone in the shower room opposite her door. I guess it was Ruth in there, so I let myself into her room and was standing waiting for her, looking at the view from her window over all the rooftops. About five minutes passed, then she came in wrapped in a towel. To now, to be fair, she wasn't expecting me for an- another hour. I suppose all we all feel a bit vulnerable after a shower with, with just a towel on. Even so, the look of alarm that went across her face took me aback. I have to a- explain this a bit. Of course, I was expecting her to be a little surprised, but the thing was, after she had taken it in and seen it was me, there was a clear second, maybe more, when she was she, when she went on looking at me, if not with fear, then with real weariness. It was like she had been waiting and waiting for me to do something to her, and she had thought the time had now come. The look was gone the next instant, and we just carried on as usual. But that incident gave me gave us both a jolt. It made me realize Ruth didn't trust me, and for all I know. For all I know, maybe she herself hadn't fully realized it until that very moment. In any case, after that day, at atmosphere, <laughs> the atmosphere got even worse. It was like we had let something out in the open and far from clearing the air. It had made us more aware than ever of everything that had come between us. It got to the stage where before... I went in to see her. I would sit inside my car for several minutes, working myself out for the ordeal. After one particular session, when we did all the checks on her in stony silence, then afterwards, just sat there in in more silence, I was about ready to report to them that it hadn't worked out, that I should stop being Ruth's carer. But then, everything changed again. And that was because of the boat. One moment for coffee. God knows how these things work. Sometimes it's a particular joke, sometimes a rumor. It travels from center to center, right the way across the country in matter of days, and suddenly every donor is talking all about it. Well, this time it was to do with this boat. I first heard about it from a couple of my donors up in the North Wales, Then a few days later, Ruth too was telling me all about it and I was just relieved we had found something to talk about and encourage her to go on. This boy, on the next floor, she said. His carer has actually been to see it. He says it's not far from the road so anyone can get to it without much bother. This boat, it was just sitting there stranded in the marshes. 
How did it get there? I ask. How do I know? Maybe they wanted to dump it, whoever owned it, or maybe sometime when everything was flooded, it just drifted in and got itself be got itself beached. Who knows? It's supposed to be this old fishing boat with a little cabin for a couple of fishermen to squeeze into when it's stormy. The next few moments, I came to see her. She always managed to bring it up the bo- bring up the boat again. Then one afternoon, when he when she began telling me how one of the other donors at the, at the center had been taken by her care to go see it, I said to her, "Look, it's not particularly near, you know. It would take about an hour, maybe ha- an hour and a half to drive." I wasn't suggesting anything. I know you have got other donors to worry about. But you would like to see it. You would like to see this boat, wouldn't you, Ruth? I suppose so. I suppose I would. You spend a day you spend day after day in this place. Yeah, it'd be good to see something like that. And do you suppose I said this gently, without a hint of sarcasm? If we are driving all that way, we should think about calling in on Tommy? Seeing that his center is just down the road from where this boat's meant to be. Ruth's face did, didn't show anything at first. I suppose we could think about it, she said. Then she laughed and added, Honest, Kathy, that wasn't the only reason I've been going on about this boat. I do want to see it for its own sake. All this time in and out of hospital, then cooped up here. Things like that matter more than once did. But alright, I did know, I knew Tommy was at the King's Field Center. Are you sure you want to see him? Yes, she said, no hesitation, looking straight at me. Yes, I do. Then she said quietly, I haven't seen that boy for a long time, not since the cottages. Then at last, we talked about Tommy. We didn't go into things in a big way and I didn't learn much I didn't know already. But I think we both felt better we finally brought him up. Ruth told me how, by the time she left the cottages the autumn after me, she and Tommy had more or less drifted apart. Since we were going dif- going different places to do, our- to do our training anyway, she said, it didn't seem worth it to split up properly. So we stayed together until I left. And at that stage, we didn't say much more about it than that. As for the trip to out to see the boat, I neither agreed or dis- nor disagreed to it. That first time we discussed it, but over the next couple of weeks, Ruth kept bringing it up and our plan somehow grew firmer. Until the end, I sent a message to, to Tommy's carer through a contact, saying that unless we heard from Tommy telling us not to do it, we would show up at the Kingsfield on a particular afternoon the following week. Chapter 18 is done. Chapter 19 now. I had hardly ever been, been to the King's Fields in those days, so Ruth and I had to consult a map a number of times on the way, and we still arrived several minutes late. It's not very well appointed as recovery centers go, and if it wasn't for the association it now has for me, if it's not somewhere I would look forward to visiting, it's out of the way and awkward to get to, and yet, when you are there, there's no real sense of peace and quiet. You can always hear the traffic on the big roads beyond the fencing, and there's a general feeling they never properly finish converting the place. A lot of the donors' rooms you can you can't get to without with a wheelchair, and or else they are too stuffy or too draughty. There aren't nearly enough bathrooms, and the ones there are are hard to keep clean, and get freezing in the winter and generally too far from the donors' room. The Kingsfields, in other words, falls way short of a place like Roof Centre in Dover, with its gleaming wood tiles and double glazed windows that seal at the twist of a hand of a handle. Later on, after the King's Fields became fa- became the familiar and precious place it did, I was in one of the admin buildings and came across a framed black and white photo of the place the way it was before it was converted, when it was still a ho- holiday camp, a holiday camp for ordinary families. 
the picture was probably taken in the late 50s or early 60s and shows a big rectangular swimming pool with all the happy people in it. Children, parents splashing about having a great time. It's concrete all around pool, but people have set up, set up deck chairs and sun loungers and they have got large parasols to keep them in shade. When I first saw this, it took me a while to realize I was looking at what the donors now call the square, the place where you drive in when you first arrive in the center. Of course, the pool's filled in by now, but the outline is still there. They have left standing at one end, an example of this unfinished atmosphere, the metal frame for high diving board. It was only when I saw the photo, it occurred to me that the what the frame was and why it was there. Today, each time I see it, I can't help picturing a swimmer taking a dive off the top only, only to crash into the cement. The cement, sorry. I might not have easily recognized the square in the photo except for the white bunker like two story building in the back background on all three visible sides of the pool area. That must have been where the families had their hol holiday apartments. And though I guess the interiors have changed a lot, the outside looks much the same. In some ways, I suppose the square today isn't so different to what the, the pool was back then. It's the social hub of the place where donors come out of their rooms for a bit of air and chat. There are a few wooden picnic benches around the square, but especially when the sun's too hot or it's raining, the donors prefer to gather under the overhanging flat roof of Recreation Hall at the far end behind the old diving board frame. That afternoon, Ruth and I went to Kingsfield. It was overcast and a bit chilly, and as we drove into the square, it was deserted except for a group of six or seven shadowy figures underneath that roof. As I brought the car to a stop somewhere over the old pool, which of course I didn't know about then. One figure detached itself from the group and came towards us, and I saw it was Tommy. He had on a faded green tracksuit top and looked about a stone heavier than I had last saw him. Beside me, Ruth for a second seemed to panic. What do we do? She went. Do we get out? No, no, no. Let's not get out. Don't move, don't move. I don't know what I had been intending to do, but when Ruth said this, for some reason, without really thinking about it, I just stepped out of the car. Ruth stayed where she was, and that's why, when Tommy came up to us, his gaze fell on me. Why it was me, he hugged first. I could smell a faint odor of something medical on him, which I couldn't identify. Then though, we hadn't said, yet said anything to each other, we both sensed Ruth was watching us from the car and pulled away. Then, there was a lot of sky reflected in the green, in the windscreen, so we couldn't make her out very well, but I got the impression Ruth had on a serious, almost frozen look, like Tommy and I were people in the play that she was watching. There was something odd about the look and it made me quite uneasy. Then Tommy was walking past me to the car, she, he opened the rear door got into the back seat and then it was my turn to watch them inside the car exchanging words then polite little kisses on the cheeks across the square the donors up under the roof were all were also watching and though i felt nothing hostile about them i suddenly wanted to get out there quickly but i made myself take my time getting back into the car so that tommy and ruth could have a little longer to themselves we be we began by driving through narrow twisting lanes, then we came out into open, featureless countryside and traveled on along a near empty road. What I remember about that part of our trip to the boat was that for the first time in, in ages, the sun started to shine weakly through the grayness, and whenever I glanced at Ruth beside me, she had on a quiet little smile. As for what we talk about, well, my memory is that we behave much as if we had been seeing each other regularly and there was no need to talk about anything other than what we had immediately in front of us. I asked Tommy if he had been if he had been to see the boat already and he said no, he hadn't, but a lot of the other donors at the center had. He had had a few opportunities but he hadn't taken 
them. I wasn't not wanting to go, he said, leaning t- forward from the back. I couldn't be bothered, really. I was going to go once with a couple of the others and their carers, but then I got a bit of bleeding and I couldn't go o- go anymore. That was ages ago now. I don't get any troubles like that anymore. Then, a, li- a little further on, as we continued across the empty countryside, Ruth turned right around in her seat until she was facing Tommy and just kept looking at him. She still had this had on her little smile and said nothing. I could see in the mirror that Tommy was looking distinct, distinctly uncomfortable. He kept looking out of the window beside him, then back at her, then back out at the rim of the window again. After a while, without taking her gaze off him, Ruth started on a rambling anecdote about something someone or other, a donor at her center, someone we had never heard of and all the time kept looking at Tommy, the gentle smile never leaving her face. Perhaps because I was getting bored by her anecdote, perhaps because I wanted to help Tommy out, I interrupted after a few minutes or after a minute or so saying, yeah, okay, we don't need to hear every last thing about her. I said this without any malice and really hadn't intended anything by it but even before Ruth passed, almost as I was speaking, Tommy suddenly made a laughing noise, a kind of explosion, a noise I had never heard him make before and he said, that's exactly what I was about to say. I lost track of it a while ago. My eyes were on the road, so I wasn't sure if he had addressed me or Ruth. In any case, Ruth stopped talking and slowly turned back in her seat, well, until she was facing the front again. She didn't seem particularly upset, but the smile had gone and her eyes looked far away, fixed somewhere on the sky ahead of it, ahead of us. But I have to be honest, at that instant, I wasn't really thinking about Ruth. My heart had done a little leap, because in a single stroke, with that little laugh of agreement, it felt as though Tommy and I had come close together again after all these years. I found the turning we needed around 20 minutes after we set out from the Kingsville. We went down a narrow curving road, shrouded by hedges and parked beside a clump of sycamores. I led the way to the to where the woods began, but then faced with three distinct paths through the trees, had to stop to consult a sheet of directions I had brought with me. While I, w- while I stood there trying to decipher the person's handwriting, I was suddenly conscious of Ruth and Tommy standing behind me, not talking, waiting almost like children to be told where to go. We entered the, wo- the, ro- the woods, and though it was pretty easy walking, I recognized Sorry, I noticed no, Ruth's breath coming less and less easily. Tommy, by contrast, didn't seem to be experiencing any f- difficulty, though there was a hint of limp in his gait. Then we came to a barbed wire fr- fence, which was tilted and rusted, and the wire itself yanked all over the place. When Ruth saw it, she came to an abrupt halt. Oh no, she said anxiously. Then she, t- then she turned to me. You didn't say anything about this. You didn't say we had to get past barbed wires. It's not going to be difficult, I said. We can go under it. We just have to hold each other. We just hope we just need to hold it for each other. But Ruth looked really upset and didn't move. And it was then she stood there, her shoulders riding, rising and falling with her breathing, that Tommy seemed to become aware for the first time just how frail she was. Maybe she had noticed before but hadn't wanted to take it in. But now, he stared at her for a good few seconds. Then I think what happened next, though of course I can't know for sure, was that the both of, the both of us, Tommy and I, we remembered what had happened in the car when we, were, when we had more or less ganged up on her. And almost an, as an instinct, we both went to her and took an arm and Tommy supported her elbow on the other side, and we, and we began gently guiding her towards the fence. I let go of Ruth, only to pass through the fence myself. Then I held up the wire as high as I could, and Tommy and I both helped her through. It wasn't so difficult for her in the end. It was more of a confidence thing, and with us there for support, she seems to lose her fear of the fence. 
On the other side, she actually made a go of helping me hold up the wire for Tommy. He came through without a bother and Ruth said to him, It's only bending down like that. I'm sometimes not so clever at it. Tommy was looking sheepish and I wonder if he was embarrassed by what had just happened or if he remembering our ganging up on Ruth in the car. He nodded towards the trees in front of us and said, I suppose it's true that way. Is that right, Cass? I glanced at my sheet and began to lead the way again. Further into the trees, it grew quite dark and the ground became more and more marshy. I hope we don't get lost, I heard Ruth say to Tommy with a laugh. But I could see a clearing not far away. And now, with time to reflect, I realized why I was so bothered by what had happened in the car. It wasn't simply that we had ganged up on Ruth. It was the way she had taken. She had just taken it in. In the olden days, it was inconceivable she would have let something like that happen without striking back. At this, as this point sunk in, I paused on the path, waited for Ruth and Tommy to catch up, and put my arms around Ruth's shoulders. This didn't seem so soppy. It just looked like a. Ca- it just looked like a carer's stuff, because by now there was something uncertain about her walk, and I wonder if I had badly underestimated how weak she was. Her breathing was getting quite laboured, and as we walked together, she had now and then lurched into me. But then we were through the trees and into the clearing, and we could see the boat. Actually, we hadn't really stepped into a clearing. It was more that the the thin woods we had come through had ended, and now in front of us there was a white marshland as far as we could see. The pale sky looked vast, and you could see reflected every so often in the patches of water breaking up the land. Not so long ago, the woods must have extended further because you could see here and the ghostly dead, f- ghostly dead trunks poking out of the soil most of them broken off only a few feet up, and beyond the dead, tr- dead trunks, maybe 60 yards away, was the boat, sitting beach in the marshes under the weak sun. Oh, it's just like my friend said it was, Ruth said. It's really beautiful. We were surrounded by silence when we started to move towards the boat. You could hear the squelch under our shoes. Before long, I noticed my feet sinking beneath the tufts of grass and called out, Okay, this is as far as we can go. But the other two, who were behind me, raised no objection. And when I glanced over my shoulder, I saw Tommy was again holding Ruth by the arm. It was clear though, this was just to steady her. I took, lo- I took long strides to the nearest dead tree trunk, where the soil was firmer, and held onto it for balancing. Following my example, Tommy and Ruth made their way to another tree trunk, hollow and emaciated than mine. A short way be- behind to my left, they perched on either side of it and seemed to settle. Then we gazed at the beach boat. I could see now how its painting was cracking and how the timber frames of the little cabin were crumbling away. It had once been painted of sky blue, but now looked almost white under the, under the sky. I wonder how it got here, I said. I had raised my voice to let, let it get to the others and ha- had expected an echo, but the sound was surprisingly close, like I was being in a carpeted room. Then I heard Tommy say behind me, Maybe this is what Hailsham looks like now, do you think? Why would it look like this? Ruth sounded genuinely puzzled. It wouldn't turn into marshland just because it's closed. I suppose not, wasn't thinking. But I always see Hailsham being like this now, no logic to it. In fact, this is pretty close to the picture in my head. Except there's no boat, of course. It wouldn't be so bad if it's like this now. That's funny, Ruth said. Because I was having this dream the other morning. I was dreaming. I was up in the room 14. I knew the whole place had been shut down, but there I was in room 14. And I was looking out of the window, and everything outside was flooded, just like a giant lake. And I could see rubbish floating by under my window. Empty empty drink cartons, everything. But there wasn't, a, there wasn't any sense of panic or anything like that. 
It was nice and tranquil, just like it is here. I knew I wasn't in any danger, that it was only like that because it had closed down. You know, Tommy said, Meg B was at our center for a while. She's left now, gone up north somewhere for her third donation, and never heard how she got on. Have you either of you heard? I shook my head, and when I didn't hear Ruth say anything, turned back to look at her. At first, I thought she was still staring at the boat. Then I saw her gaze. Her gaze was on the vapor trail of the plane in the far distance, climbing slowly into the sky. Then she said, I'll tell you something I heard. I heard about Chrissy. I heard she completed during her second donation. I heard that as well, said Tommy. It must be right. I heard exactly the same. Shame. Only her second as well. Glad that didn't happen to me. I think it happens much more than they ever tell us, Ruth said. My Carol over there, she probably knows that's right, but she won't say. There's no big conspiracy about it, I said, turning back to the boat. Sometimes it happens. It was really sad about Chrissy. But that's not common. They're really careful these days. But it happens much more than they tell us, Ruth said again. That's one reason why they keep us moving around between donations. I ran into Rodney once. It wasn't so long after Chrissy completed. I saw him in this clinic up at the North Wales. He was doing okay. I bet he was cut up about Chrissy though, said Ruth then to Tommy. They don't tell you the half of it, you see. Actually, I said, he wasn't too bad about it. He was sad, obviously, but he was okay. They hadn't seen each other for a couple of years anyway. He said that he thought Chrissy wouldn't have minded too much. But I suppose he should know. Why Why would he know? Ruth said. How could he possibly know what Chrissy would have felt? What she would have wanted? It wasn't him on that table trying to cling on to life. How, how, would, we, how would he know? This flash of anger was more like Ruth, the old Ruth, and made me turn to her again. Maybe it was the glare in her face, in her eyes, sorry. And she seemed to be looking back at me with hard, stern expression. It can't be good, Tommy said, completing a second donation. Can't be good. I can't believe Rodney was okay with it, Ruth said. You only spoke to him for a few minutes. How can you tell anything from that? Yeah, said Tommy. But if, like Kev said, they had already split up, that wouldn't make any difference. Ruth cut in. In some ways, that might even that might have even made it worse. I've seen a lot of people in Rodney's position, I said. They do come to terms with it. How would you know? Said Ruth. How could you possibly know? You are still a carer. I get to see a lot as a carer. An awful lot. She wouldn't know, would she, Tommy? Not what it's really like? For a moment, we were both looking at Tommy and he just went on gazing at the boat. And then he said, There was this guy at my center. Always worried that he wouldn't make it past his second. Used to say that he could feel it in his bones, but it all turned out fine. He just come out of he just come through his third now, and he's completely all right. He put up his hand. He put up a hand to shield his eyes. I wasn't much good as a carer. Never learned to draw to drive even. I think that's why the notice for for my first came so early. I know it's not supposed to work that way, but I reckon that's what it was. Didn't mind it really. I'm I'm a pretty good donor, but I was a lousy carer. No one spoke for a while. Then Ruth said, her voice quieter now. I think I was a pretty decent carer, but five years felt about enough for me. I was like you, Tommy. I was pretty much ready when I became a donor. It felt right. After all, it's what we're supposed to be doing, isn't it? I wasn't sure if she was expecting me. To respond to this. She hadn't said it in any obviously leading way and it's perfectly possible this was just a statement that she had come up with just out of habit. It was the sort of thing that you hear donors say to each other all the time. When I turned to them again, Tommy still had his hand up to shade his eyes. Pity we can't get closer to the boat, he said. One day when it's drier, maybe we could come back. I'm glad to have seen it, Ruth said softly. It's really nice, but I think I want to go back now. 
The wind's getting quite chilly. At least we have seen it now, Tommy said. We chatted much more freely on our way on our walk back to the car than on on then on, then on the way out. Ruth and Tommy were comparing notes on their centers, the food, the towels, the kind of thing. And I was always part of the conversation because they kept asking me about the other centers, if this or that was normal. Ruth's walk was much steadier now, and when we came to the fence and I held up the wire, she hardly hesitated. We got into the car again with Tommy in the back, and for a while there was a perfectly okay feeling between us. Maybe, looking back, there was an oath an atmosphere of something being held back but it's possible that I'm only thinking now because of what happened next the way it began it was a bit like a repeat of the earlier we had got back in, onto the long near empty road and Ruth made some remark about the poster we were passing and I don't even remember the poster now it was just one of those huge advertising images on the roadside she made the remark almost to herself, obviously not meaning much by it. She said something like, Oh my god, look at that one. You would think they would at least try to come up with something new. But Tommy said from the back, Actually, I quite like that one. It's been in the newspapers as well. I think it's got something. Oh. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> morning maybe i was wanting that feeling again of me and tommy being brought closer together because although the walk to the boat had been fine in itself i was starting to feel that apart from our first embrace and that moment in the car earlier on tommy and i hadn't really had much to do with each other anyway i found myself saying actually i like it too it takes quite a lot of e a lot more effort than you would think, making up these posters. That's right, Tommy said. Someone told me it takes weeks and weeks putting something like that together, months even. People sometimes work all night on them, over and over, until they are just right. It's too easy, I said, to criticize when you're just driving by. Easiest thing in the world, Tommy said. Ruth said nothing and kept looking at the empty road in front of us in front of us and then I said since we are on the subject of posters there was one I noticed on the way out it should be coming up again pretty soon it sh it'll be on our side this time it should come up at any time soon what's it off? Tommy asked you see it'll be coming up soon I glanced at Ruth beside me there was no anger in her eyes just a kind of weariness there was even a sort of hope I thought that when the poster appeared, it would be pr perfectly innocuous. Something that reminded us of Hailsham. Something like that. I could see all of this in her face, the way it didn't quite settle on any expression, but hovered tentatively. All the time, her gaze be remained fixed in front of her. And I slowly, and I slowed down the car and pulled over, bumping up onto the rough edges. Okay... Why are we stopping, Kev? Tommy asked. Because you can see it best from here. Any nearer, we have to look up at it too much. I could hear Tommy shifting behind us, trying to get better view. Ruth didn't move. I wasn't even sure she was looking at the poster at all. Okay, it's not exactly the same, I said after a moment, but it reminded me of open plan office, smart smiling people. Ruth stayed silent. But Tommy said at the back, I get it. You mean like the place we went to that time? Not only that, I said. It's a lot like that ad. The one we found on the ground. You, rem you remember, Ruth? I'm not sure if I do. She said quietly. Oh, come on. You remember? We found it in a magazine in some lane near a puddle. You were really taken by it. Don't remember. Don't pretend that you don't remember. I think I do. Ruth's voice. Now, almost a whisper, a lorry went past, making our car wobbled and for a few seconds obscuring our view of the hoarding. Ruth bowed her, he her head. 
as though he hoped the lorry had moved the image forever. When we could see it clearly, clearly again, she didn't raise her gaze. It's funny, I said, remembering it all now. Remember how you used to go on about it? How you one day work in an office like that? Oh yeah, that's why we went that day, Tommy said. Like he had only at the second remembered. When we were when we went to Norfolk, we went to find your possible working in an office. Don't you sometimes think, I said to Ruth, you should have looked into it more? Alright. You would have been the first the first one any of us would have heard of getting to do something like that. But you might have done it. Don't you wonder sometimes what might have happened if you hadn't tried? How could I have tried? Ruth's voice was hardly audible. It was just something I only dreamt once about, that's all. But if you at least look up at, into it, how do you know? They might have let you. Yeah, Ruth, Tommy said. Maybe you should have at least tried. After going on about it so much, I think Kev's got a point. I didn't go on about it, Tommy. At least I don't remember going on about it. But Tommy's right. You should have at least tried. Then you can see a poster like that one. I remember that's what you wanted once. And that you at least look into it. How could I have looked into it? For the first time, Ruth's voice had hardened. And then she let out a sigh and looked down again. Then Tommy said, You kept talking like you might qualify for a special treatment. And for all you know, you might have done. You should have at least asked. Ask? Okay, Ruth said. You say that I should have looked into it. How? Where should, would, I have, would I have gone? There wasn't a way to look into it. Tommy is right though, I said. If you, believe in your, if you believe yourself special, you should have at least asked. You should have gone to Madame and asked. As soon as I said this, as soon as I mentioned Madame, I realized I had made a mistake. Ruth looked up at me, and I saw something like a triumph flash across her face. You could see it in films sometimes, when one person's pointing a gun at the other, and the, uh, and the one with the gun making the other one do all kinds of things. Then suddenly, there's a mistake. A tussle, and a gun with the second person, and the second person looks at the first person with a gleam. A kind of can't-believe-my-luck expression that promises all kind of vengeance. Well... That was how suddenly Ruth was looking at me, though I said nothing about defer deferrals. deferrals. I had mentioned Madame, and I knew we would stumble into some, some new territory to together. Ruth saw my panic and shifted around in her seat to face me. I was, so I was preparing myself for her attack, busy telling myself that no matter what she came at me with, things were different now, she shouldn't get her way like she did. She had done in the past. I was telling myself all of this, and that's why I wasn't at all ready for what she did come out with. Kathy, she said, I don't really expect you to forgive me, ever. I can't even see why you did, but I'm going to ask you to do all the same. I was so thrown by this. All I could find to say was a rather limped, Forgive you for what? Forgive me for what? Well... For starters, there's the way I always lied to you about your urges when you used to tell me back then how sometimes it got you s wanted to do it with virtually anyone. Tommy shifted again behind us, but Ruth was leaning forward now, looking straight at me like a moment Tommy wasn't in like the moment Tommy wasn't with us in the car at all. I knew how it worried you, I said. I should have told you. I should have said how it was the same for me too. Just the way you described it. You realize all this now, I know. But you didn't back then, and I should have said. I should have told you how even though I was with Tommy, I couldn't resist doing it with other people sometimes. At least three others when we were at the cottages. She said this, all this without looking at Tommy's way. But it wasn't so much like she was ignoring him than she was trying so intensely to get through to me, everything else had been blurred. I almost did tell you a few times, she went on, but I didn't. Even then, at that time, I realized you would look back one day and realize and blame me for it. But I didn't say anything to you. There's no reason you should ever forgive me for that. But 
I want to ask you now because... She stopped suddenly. Because of what? I asked. She laughed and said, Because nothing. I would like you to forgive me and I don't expect you to. Anyway, it's not the half of it. Not even a small bit of it actually. The main thing is, I kept you and Tommy apart. Her voice dropped again, almost to a whisper. That's the worst thing I did. She turned a little. Taking Tommy in her gaze for the first time, then almost immediately she was looking just at me again. And now, But now, it was like she was talking to the both of us. That's the worst thing I did, she said again. I'm not even asking you to forgive me for about that. God, I've said all this in my head so many times. I can't believe I'm really doing it. It should have been the two of you. I'm not pretending I didn't always see that. Of course I did, as far as I can remember, but I kept you apart. I'm not asking you to forgive me for that. That's not what I'm after just now. What I want is for you to put it right. Put right what I messed up for you. What do you mean, Ruth? Tommy asked. How do you mean, put it right? His voice was gentle, full of childlike curiosity, and I think that was what started me sobbing. Kathy, listen, Ruth said. You and Tommy, you've got to try and get a deferral. If it's you two, there's got to be a chance, a real chance. She had reached out a hand and put on my shoulder, but I shook her off roughly and glared at her through tears. It's too late for that now, way too late. It's not too late, Kathy. Listen, it's not too late. Okay, so Tommy's done two donations. Who said that has to make any difference? It's too late for all of that now. I've started to sob again. It's stupid to even just thinking about it. As stupid as wanting to work in that office up there. We are all way beyond that now. Ruth was shaking her head. It's not too late. Tommy, you tell her. I was leaning on the steering wheel so I couldn't see Tommy at all. He made a kind of puzzled humming sound and didn't say anything. Look, Ruth said. Both of you listen, I just wanted all of us to do this trip because I wanted to say what I just said. But I also wanted it because I wanted to give you something. She has been rummaging in the pockets of her anorak and now she held out a crumpled piece of paper. Tommy, you better take this. Look after it. Then when Kathy, when Kathy changed her mind, you'll have it. Tommy reached forward between the seats and took the paper. Thanks, Ruth, he said, like she had given him a chocolate bar. Then, after a few seconds, he said, What is it? I don't get it. It's Madame's address. It's like you were saying to me just now. You've got to at least try. How did you find it? Tommy asked. It wasn't easy. It took me a long time, and I ran a few risks. But I got it in the end. I got it for the two of you. Now it's up to you to find her and try. I had stopped sobbing by now and started the engine. That's enough of all this, I said. We've got to get Tommy back. Then we need to get, we need to be getting back ourselves. But would you think about it? Both of you, won't you? I just want to get back now. Tommy, you keep that address safe in case Kathy comes around. I'll keep it. Tommy said, then much more solemnly than the last time. Thanks, Ruth. We've seen the boat, I said, but now we've got to get back. It might be over two hours to get back to Dover. I put the car on the road again and my memory of it is that we didn't talk much more on the way back to the Kingsville. There was still a small group of donors huddled under the roof when we came into the square. I turned the car before letting Tommy out. Neither of us hugged or kissed him, but as he walked away towards his fellow donors, he paused and gave us a big smile and wave. It might seem odd, but on the journey back to Ruth Center, we didn't really discuss any of what had just happened. It was partly because Ruth was exhausted, and that last conversation on the roadside seemed to have drained her. But also, I think we both sensed we had done enough serious talking for the one day, and that if we tried any more of it, things would start to go wrong. I'm not sure how Ruth was feeling on the, dri on the drive home, but, but as for me, once all the strong emotions had settled, once the night had began to set in and all the lights came on, 
alongside the roadside. Along the roadside, I was feeling okay. It was like something had been hanging over me for a long time had gone, and even the things were still far from being sorted. It felt like there was now at least a door open to somewhere better. I'm not saying that I was elated or anything like that. Everything between the three of us seemed really delicate, and I felt tense. But it wasn't altogether a bad tension. I, we didn't even discuss Tommy beyond saying how he looked okay and be wondering how much weight he had put on. Then, we spent large three stretches of the journey watching the road together in silence. It wasn't until a few days later when I came to see what a difference the trip had made. All the guardedness and the suspicions between me and Ruth evaporated and we seemed to remember everything we have once meant to each other. And that was the start of it. That era, with the summer coming on, and Ruth's health at least on an even keel, and I had come in the evenings with biscuits and mineral water, and we would sit side by, side by side by her window, watching the sun go down over the roofs, talking about Hailsham, the cottages, anything that drifted into our minds. When I think about Ruth now, of course, I feel sad that she's gone, but I also feel grateful for the period that we had at the end. There was even so one topic we never discussed properly, and that was about what she had said to us on the roadside that day. Just every now and then, Ruth would allude to it. She had come up with something like, Have you thought any more about becoming Tommy's carer? You know you could arrange it if you wanted to. Soon, it was this idea of my becoming Tommy's carer, and that came to stand in for all the rest of it. I would tell her that I was thinking about it, that anyway, it wasn't so simple even for me to arrange such a thing. Then, we would usually let, let the topic drop. But I could tell it was never far from Ruth's mind. And that's why, the very last time I saw her, even though she wasn't able to speak, I knew it was what she wanted to say to me. That was three days after her second donation when they finally let me in to see her in the small hours in the morning. She was in the room by herself, and it looked like they had done everything they could for her. It had become obvious to me by then, from the way the doctors, the coordinator, the nurses were behaving, that they didn't think she was going to make it. Now I took one glance at her in the hospital bed, under the dull light, and recognized the look on her face, which I had seen on donors often enough before. It was like she was willing her eyes to see right inside herself so she could patrol and marshal all the better separate areas of pain in her body the way maybe an anxious carer might rush between three or four ailing donors in different parts of the country she was strictly speaking still conscious but she wasn't accessible to me as i stood there beside her metal bed all the same i pulled up a chair and sat with her hands in both of mine, squeezing whenever I f another flirt of pain made her twist away from me. I stayed beside her like that for as long as they let me, three hours maybe longer, and as I say, for almost all of that time, she was far away inside herself, but just once, as she was twisting herself in a way that seemed scarily unnatural, and I was on the verge of calling the nurses for more painkillers, just for a few seconds, no more, she looked straight at me. She knew exactly who I was. It was one of those little islands of lucidity donors sometimes get into the midst of their ghastly battles, and she looked at me, just for that moment. And although she didn't speak, I knew what her look meant. So I said to her, It's okay. I'm going to do it, Ruth. I'm going to become Tommy's carer as soon as I can. I said it under my breath, because I didn't think she would hear the words anyway, even if I shouted them. But my hope was that, with our gazes locked as they were, for those few seconds, she would read my expression exactly I had read hers, then, the moment was over, and she was away again. Of course, I'll never know for sure what, but I think she did understand. And even if she didn't, what occurs to me now is that she probably knew all along, even before I did, that I would become Tommy's carer and that we would, and we would give it a try, just as she had told us to do in the car that day. That was chapter 19. 
Thank you, Dian, for helping me with Party Finder. <coughs> Chapter 20 Tommy's carer almost a year to the day after the trip to see the boat. It wasn't long after Tommy's third donation, and though he was recovering well, he was still needing a lot of time to rest. And as it turned out, that wasn't a bad way at all for all of us to start this new phase together. Before long, I was getting used to Kingsfield and growing to like it even. Most donors at Kingsfields get their own room after the third donation, and Tommy was given one of the largest singles in the center. Some people assume afterwards I had fixed it for him, but that wasn't the case, it was just luck. And anyway, it wasn't that great of a room. I think it had been a bathroom back in the holiday camp days because the only window had frosted gra glass and was really high up near the ceiling. You could only look out by standing on a chair and holding open the pane. Then, you got a view down onto the dense shrubbery. The room was L-shaped, which meant they could get in, as well as the usual bed and chair, wardrobe, a little desk and a lift-up lift up lid, an item that proved a real bonus, as I will explain. I don't want to give a wrong, the wrong idea that the period at the, that the, period at the Kingsfields Wait, I don't want to keep the wrong idea about that period at the Kingsfields. A lot of it was really re relaxed, almost idyllic. My usual time to arrive at was after lunch, and I had come up to, to find Tommy stretched out on the narrow bed, always fully clothed and because he didn't want to be like a patient. I sit in the chair and I read to him from various paperbacks I bring in, stuff like the Odyssey or 1001 Nights. Otherwise, we would just talk. Sometimes about the old days, sometimes about other things. He would often doze off in the late afternoon and I would catch up on my reports over his school desk. It was re really amazing the way the years seems to melt away. We were so easy with, with each other. Obviously, though, not everything was like before. For the start, Tommy and I finally started having sex. I don't know how much Tommy had thought about us having sex before we started. He was still recovering after all, maybe it wasn't the first thing in his mind. I wasn't wanting to force it on him, but on the other hand, it had occurred to me that if we left it too long, just when we had started out together again, it would, it would just get harder and harder to make it natural part of us. And my other thought, I suppose, was that if our plans went along the lines, Ruth had started, and we did find ourselves going for deferrals, it might prove a real drawback if we never asked never had sex. I don't mean I thought this was necessary something they would ask us about, but my worry was that it would show somehow in a kind of lack of intimacy. So I decided to start it off one afternoon in that room in a way he could take he could take a leave. He had been lying in bed as usual, staring at the ceiling while I read to him. When I finished I went over, sat on the edge of the bed, slid his a hand under his T shirt. Pretty soon, I was down around his stuff, and though it took a while for him to get hard, I could tell straight away that he was happy about it. That w that first time, we still had stitches to worry about, but anyway, after all the years of knowing each other and not having sex, it was like we needed some intermediary stage before we could get into a full-blown way. So after a while, I just did it for him with my hands and he just lay there, not making any attempt to fill me up in return. Not even making any noises, but just looking peaceful. But even that first time, there was something there, a feeling right there alongside our sense that this was the beginning, a gateway we were passing through. I didn't want to acknowledge it for a long time, and even if I did, I tried to persuade myself that it was something that would go away along with his various aches and pains. What I mean is, 
right from the first time, there was something in Tommy's manner that was tinged with sadness. And I'm glad we're doing it now. Wait, so, so that seems to say, yes, we're doing it now, and I'm glad we're doing it now. But what a pity that we left it so late. And in the days followed when we had proper sex, we were really happy about it. Even then, the same nagging feeling would always be there. I did everything to keep it away. I had us going it, going at it all stops, but uh, sorry, all stops out, so that everything would be delirious, would, would be a delirious blur, and there's there would be no room for anything else. If, we, if he was on top, I would put my knees right up for him. Whatever position we use, I would say anything, do anything I thought would make it better, more passionate. But it still never quite went away. Maybe it was to do with that room. The way the sun came in through the frosted glass, so that even in the early summer, it felt like autumn light. Or maybe it was because a stray sound that would occasionally reach us as we lay there. Our donors milling about and going up, going about their businesses around the grounds, and not of the students sitting in the grassy field arguing about novel novels or poetry, or maybe it had to do with how sometimes even after we had done it really well and were lying in each other's arms, bits of what we had just done still drifting into our heads. Tommy would say something like, "I used to be able to do it twice in a row easy, but I can't anymore." Then. The feeling would come right to the fore and I had to put my hand over his mouth whenever he said things like that, just so we could go on lying there in peace. I'm sure Tommy felt it too, because we had, oh, we had always hold each other very tight after times like that, as though that's the way we managed to keep the feelings away. For the first few weeks after I, uh, I arrived, we hardly brought up Madame or that conversation with Ruth in the car that day. But the very fact of my having become his carer served as a reminder that we weren't there to mark time. And so too, of course, did Tommy's animal drawings. I had often wondered about Tommy's animals over the years. And even that day we had gone to see the boat, I had been tempted to ask him about, the, about them. Was he still drawing them? Had he kept the ones that from the cottages? But the whole history around them had made it difficult for me to ask. Then one afternoon, maybe about a month after I started, I came up to his room and found him at his school desk, carefully going through, going over a drawing. His face nearly touching the paper. He would call for me to come in when I knocked out, when I knocked. But now he didn't raise his head or stop what he's doing and just a glance told me that he was working on one of his imaginary creatures. I stopped in the doorway, uncertain whether I should come in, but noticed and but I noticed look identical to the black books that he got from the Kaffirs all those years ago. I came in then and then we talked about something else entirely and after a while he put away his notebooks without his mentioning about it. But after that, I would often come in and see it left on the desk and tossed beside the window. Then one day, we were about, we were up in his room with several minutes to kill before we set off some checks. I noticed something odd coming into his manner, something coy and deliberate that makes me think that he was after some sex. But then he said, Kath, I just want you to tell me, tell me honestly. Then the black notebook came out of his desk, and he showed me three separate sketches of a kind of frog, except with a long tail as though part of it had stayed a tadpole. At least, that's what it looks like when you held it away from you. Close up, each sketch was a mask of minute detail, much like the creatures that I had seen before. These two, I did thinking they were made of metal. He said, see, everything got shiny surfaces, but this one here, I thought I would make him, make him rubbery, you see, almost blobby. I wanted, to, I wanted to do a proper version now, a really good one, but I can't decide. Cast, be honest, what do you think? I can't remember what I answered. What I do remember is the strong mix of emotions that engulfed me at the moment. I realized immediately this was the Tommy's way of putting behind us everything that had happened around his drawings back at the cottages, and I felt relief, gratitude, sheer delight. But I was aware too 
why the animals had emerged again, and all of those possible layers behind Tommy's apper apparently casual query. At least, at the least, I could see he was showing me that he hadn't forgotten even though we had hardly discussed anything openly. He was telling me he, wa he wasn't complacent, that he was busy getting on with his part of the preparation. But that wasn't all that I felt looking at those particular of at those peculiar frogs that day. It was because it was there again, only faint and in background at first, but growing all the while so that afterwards it was what I kept thinking about. I couldn't help it. As I looked at those pages, the thought went through my mind even as I tried to grab it and put it away. It came to me that Tommy's drawing weren't as fresh now. Okay, in many ways, these frogs were a lot like what I had seen back at the, at the cottages, but something was definitely gone. So they looked labored, almost like they had been copied, so that the feeling came again, even though I tried to keep it out, that we are doing all of this too late, and that there had been once a time for it, but we had let that go by, and there was something ridiculous, ridiculous, reprehensible even about the way we are now thinking and planning now i'm going over this again it occurs to me that that might have been another reason we were so slow to talk openly to each other about our plans it was certainly the case that none of the other donors at Kingsfields were ever heard talking about deferrals or anything like that and we were probably vaguely embarrassed almost like we shared a shameful secret we might even have, a, have been scared of what might happen if word got out to the others. But as I say, I don't want to paint too gloomy a view of the time at the Kingsfield. For, all, for a lot of it, especially after the day he asked me about his animals, there had been no more shadows left in the past and we really settled into each other's company. And though he never asked me, Again, for advice for his pictures, he was happy to work on them in front of me and would often spend afternoons like that, me on the bed, maybe reading aloud, Tommy at the desk, drawing. Perhaps we would have been happy if things had stayed that way for a lot longer, if we could just while away more afternoons chatting, having sex, reading aloud and drawing, but with the summer drawing to an end and with Tommy getting stronger, and the possibility of notice for of his fourth donation grow ever more distinct. We knew we couldn't put, keep putting things off indefinitely. It had been quite an unusually business period for me, and I had not been, been to Kingsfield for almost a week. I arrived in the morning that day. I remember it was bucketing down. Tommy's room was almost dark. And you could hear the gutter splashing away near his window. He had been down to a main hall for breakfast with his fellow donors and had come back up again and now sitting by his bed, looking vacant, not doing anything. I came in exhausted. I had not had a proper night's sleep for ages and just collapsed onto his narrow bed, pushing him against the wall. I lay like that for a few moments and might have easily fallen asleep if Tommy hadn't kept prodding my knees with a, with a toe. Then, finally, I sat up beside him and said, I saw Madame yesterday, Tommy. I never spoke to her or anything, but I saw her. He looked at me, and, but stayed quiet. I saw, her come up this on, I saw her come up the street and go into her house. Ruth got it right. The address, the right door, everything. Then I described to him how the previous day, since I was down on the south coast anyway, I had gone to Little Hampton in the late afternoon and just as I had done for the last two times, walked down that, that long street near the seafront, past rows of terrace houses with names like Wavecrest and Sea View, until I had come to a public bench beside the phone box and I sat down and waited again the way I had done before with my eyes fixed on the house over the street. It was like detective stuff. The previous times, I would sat there for over half an hour each go, and nothing, absolutely nothing. But something told me I would be lucky this time. I have been so tired. I nearly, nearly nodded off right there on the bench, but then I looked up and she was there, coming down the street towards me. It was really spooky, I said. 
because she looked exactly the same. Maybe her face was a little older, but otherwise, there were no difference. Same clothes even. That smart grey suit. It couldn't literally... Sorry, it couldn't literally have been the same suit. I don't know. It looked like it was. So, you didn't try to speak to her? Of course not, stupid. Just one step at a time. She was never exactly nice to us, remember? I told him how she would walk past me on the opposite side, never glancing over to me, how for a second I thought she would go past the door I have been watching that Ruth had got the wrong address. But Madame had turned sharply at the gate, covered the tiny front path two or three steps, and then vanished inside. After I had finished, Tommy stayed quiet for some time. Then he said, You sure you won't get into trouble? Always driving out to places that you're not supposed to? Why do you think I'm so tired? I've been working all kinds of hours to get everything in, but at least we've found her now. The rain kept splashing outside. Tommy turned onto his side and put his head on my shoulder. Ruth did well for us, he said softly. She got it right. Yeah, she did well, but now it's up to us. So that's the plan, Kath. Have you got one? We just go there. We just go there and ask her. Next week, when I take you for the lab test, I'll get you signed up for the whole day. Then we'll go to Little Hamptons on the way back. Tommy gave a, les gave a sigh and put his head deeper in on into my shoulder. Someone watching might have thought he was being unenthusiastic, but I knew exactly what he was feeling. We have been thinking about the, about the deferrals, the theory about the gallery, all of it for so long, and now suddenly, here we are. It was definitely a bit scary. If we get this, he said eventually, just suppose we do. Suppose he let, she let us have three years, say, just to ourselves. What do we do exactly? See what I mean, Kev? Where do we go? We can't stay here. This is a center. I don't know, Tommy. Maybe she'll tell us to go back to the cottages. Maybe it'll be better somewhere else. The White Mansion, maybe. Or perhaps they got some other places. Somewhere separate for people like us. We'll just have to see what she says. We lay quietly on the bed for a few more moments, listening to the rain. At some stage, I began prodding him with the food, the way he had been doing to me earlier. Eventually, he retaliated and pushed my feet off the bed altogether. If you're really going, he said, we have to decide about the animals, you know? Choose the best ones to take along, maybe six or seven. We'll have to do it quite carefully. Okay, I said. Then I stood up and stretched out my arms. Maybe we'll take more, 15, if 20 even. Yeah, we'll go and see her. What can she do to us? We'll go and talk to her. That's chapter 20. One sip of coffee, then we'll continue chapter 21. From the days before we went, I had had in my mind this picture of me and Tommy standing in front of that door, working up the nerves to press the bell, then having to wait there with hearts thumping. The way it turned out though, we got lucky and we were spared we, um, we were spared that particular ordeal. We deserve a bit of luck by then because the day hadn't been going well at all. The car had played up on the journey out and we were an hour late to Tommy's test. Then a mix up at the clinic had meant Tommy had to redo three of the tests. This has let him feeling pretty woozy, so we finally set off the little, for Little Hampton towards the end of the afternoon. He began to feel car sick and we had to keep stopping to let him walk it off. We finally arrived just before 6 o'clock. We parked the car behind the bingo hall, took out the boots, the boot sports bag containing Tommy's notebooks and, set, and then set off towards the town center. It had been a fine day and through the shops that were closing, a lot of people were hanging out outside the pubs, talking and drinking. Tommy had began to feel better the more we walked until eventually he remembered how he had missed lunch because of all the tests and declared that he have, have to eat something 
before facing what's in front of us. So, we were searching for some place to buy a takeaway sandwich when he suddenly grabbed my arm so hard I thought he was having some sort of attack. But then, he said quietly into my ear, That's her, Calf. Look, going past the hairdressers. And sure enough, there she was, moving along the opposite pavement dressed in her neat grey suit, like just like the one that she has always worn. We set off after Madame at a, at a reasonable distance, first through the pedestrian precinct, then along the near deserted high street. I think we were both reminded of that day we had followed Ruth Possible through another town. But this time, things proved far simpler because pretty soon she had led us onto that long seafront street because the road was completely straight and because the setting, the setting sun was falling on it all the way down to the end we found ourselves let we could let madame get quite a way ahead till she wasn't much more than a dot then and there would be still no danger of losing her. In fact, we never even stopped hearing the echoes of her heels and the rhythmic thud thudding of Tommy's back against his leg seemed like to be a kind of an answer. We went sorry. We went on like that for a long time, past the rows of identical houses, then the houses on the opposite pavement ran out, areas of flat lawn appears in their place, and you could see Beyond the lawns, the top of the beach huts lining the seafront, the water itself wasn't visible, but you could tell it was there, just from the big sky and seagull noises. But the houses on our side continued without change, and after a while I said to Tommy, It's not long now, see the bench over there? That's the one I, s I sit on, the house is just over there, from it. Until I said this, Tommy had been pretty calm, but now something seemed to get to him and he began to walk much faster like he wanted to catch up with her. But now there was no one between Madame and us and as Tommy kept closing the gap, I had to grab his arm to slow him down. I was all the time afraid that she would turn back and look at us but she didn't and then she was going through in her little gateway. She paused at the door to find her keys in her bag and then there we were, standing by her gate, watching her. She didn't turn and I had an idea that she had been aware of us all along and was deliberately ignoring us. I thought too that Tommy was about to shout something at her and that would be the wrong way. That's why I called from the gate so quickly and without hesitation. It was only a polite, excuse me. But she spun around like I had thrown something at her. And as her gaze fell on us, a chill passed through me, much like the one that I had felt years ago that time. We waylaid her outside the main house. Her eyes were, her eyes were as cold, and her face maybe even more severe than I remembered. I don't know if she recognized us at that point, but without a doubt, she saw and decided in a second what we were. And you could see her stiffen, as if a pair of large spiders were set to crawl towards her. Then, something changed in her expression. It didn't become warmer exactly, but the revulsion got put away somewhere and she studied us carefully, squinting in the setting sun. Madame, I said, leaning, leaning over the gate. We don't want you, we don't want to shock you or anything, but we were at Hailsham. I'm Kathy H. Maybe you remember. This is Tommy D. We haven't ha come to give you any trouble. She came a few steps back towards us. From Hailsham, she said, and a small smile actually went across her face. Well, this is a surprise. You aren't here to give me trouble. That's why you are here? Suddenly, Tommy said, We have to talk to you. I I've brought some things. He raised his back. Some things you might find for your gallery. We've got to talk to you. Madame went on standing there, hardly moving in the slow sun. Her, her head tilted as though listening for some sound from the seafront. Then she smiled again. Through the smile, didn't seem to be for us, but for herself. Very well then. Come inside. Then, uh, then we will see what is it that you want. you wish to talk you wish to talk about as we went in 
I noticed the front door had colored glass panels, and once Tommy closed it behind us, everything got pretty dark. We were in a hallway so narrow you felt you would be able to touch the walls from either side just by stretching out your elbows. The madame had stopped in front of us and was standing still, her back to us, standing like she was listening. Peering past her, I saw the hallway, narrow as it was, divided further. To the left was a staircase going upstairs and to the right, an even narrower passage leading deeper into the house. Following Madame's example, I listened too, but there was only silence in the house. Then, maybe from somewhere upstairs, there was a faint thumb. That small noise seemed to signify something to her, because she now turned to us and pointing towards the darkness of the passage and said, Go in there and wait for me. I'll be down shortly. She, she began to climb the stairs. Then, seeing our hesitation, glean, leaned over the banister, pointing, pointed again into the, into the dark. In there, she said, and then vanished upstairs. Tommy and I wandered forward and found ourselves in what must have been the front room of the house. It was like a servant of some sort of of some sort had got the place really ready for the night time, then left the curtains closed and there were dim table lamps switched on. I could smell the old furniture, which was probably Victorian. The fireplace had been sealed off with the board, and, there, and, and where the fire would have been, there was a picture, woven like a, like a tapestry, of a strange owl-like bird staring out at you. Tommy, Tommy touched my arm pointed to a framed picture hanging in the corner of a little round table. It's the ocean, he whispered. We went up to it and I wasn't so sure. I could see that it was a pretty nice watercolor, and but the table lamp beneath it had a crooked shade covered with, with cobweb traces, and instead of lighting up the picture, it put a shine over the murky glass, so you could hardly make it out at all. It's the bit round the back of the, po the duck pond, Tommy said. What do you mean? I whispered back. It's no pond. It's just a bit of countryside. No, the pond behind you. Tommy seemed surprisingly irritated. You must be able to remember if you're round the back with the pond behind you and you're looking over towards the north playing field. We went silent again because we could hear voices somewhere in the house. It sounded like a man's voice, maybe coming from upstairs. Then we heard what was definitely Madame's voice coming down the stairs, saying, Yes, you are quite right, quite right. We waited for the Madame to come in, but her footsteps went past the door and back into the house. It flashed through my mind that she was going to prepare tea and scones and bring it all in in the trolley, but then I decided that that was rubbish, that she would she just as likely forgotten about us, and now she suddenly remember, come in and tell us to leave. Then a gruff male voice called something from upstairs, um, so muffled it might have been just two floor up. Madame's footsteps came into the hallway, then she called up. I've told you what to do, just do as I explain. Tommy and I waited several more minutes, then the wall at the back of the room began to move. I saw immediately it wasn't really a wall, but a pair of sliding doors which you could use to section off the front half of what was the otherwise a long, one long room. Madame had rolled back the doors just part of the way, and she's now standing there staring at us. I tried to see past her, and it was just darkness. I thought maybe she was waiting for us to explain why we were there, but in the end, she said, You told me you were Cathy H and Tommy D, am I correct? And that you were both at Hailsham? How long ago? I told her, but there, were no, but there was no way if she remembered us, us, us at, or not. She just went on standing there at the t threshold as though hesitating to come in, but now Tommy spoke again. We don't want to keep you long, but there's something we have to talk to you about. <laughs> so you say, well then, you better make yourself comfortable. She reached out and put her hands on the back of two matching armchairs just in front of her. There was something odd about her manner, like she hadn't really invited us to sit down. I felt that if we did as she's suggesting and sat on those chairs, she would go on standing behind us, not even talking, sorry, not even t taking her hands away from the backs. 
But when we made moves towards her, she too came forward, and perhaps I imagine it, tucked her shoulders tightly as she passed between us. We, when we turned to sit down, she was over by the windows in front of the heavy velvet curtains, holding us in a glare, like we are in a class and she was a teacher. At least, that's the way it looked to me at that moment. Tommy afterwards said that she thought she was about to burst into a song and that those curtains behind her would open and then instead of a street, it would be a flat, greasy expanse le leading to the seafront. And then there's this big stage set, like the ones we had at Hailsham, and even the chorus line to back her up. It was funny when she, he said that afterwards, but I could see her again then. Her hands claps, elbows out. Sure enough, like she was getting ready to sing. But I doubt if Tommy was really thinking anything like that at the moment. I remember no noticing how tense he had got and worrying he had blurted out something completely daft. That was why, when she asked us not unkindly, what is it that we wanted and stepped in quickly? It was probably, it probably came up pretty muddled at first. And after a while, as I became more confident she had hear me out, I calmed down and got a lot clearer. I had been turning over in my mind for few, for weeks and weeks, just what I had to say to her. I had gone over it during those long car journeys, and while sitting at quiet tables and in service stations, cafes, it had seemed so difficult then, and I had eventually resorted to a plan. I had memorized word for word a few key lines and then drawn a mental map of how I would go from one point to the next. But now, she was there in front of me. Most of what I had prepared seems either unnecessary or completely wrong. The strange thing was, and Tommy agreed when we discussed it afterwards, although at Hailsham, she had been like this hostile stranger from the outside. Now that we are facing her again, even though she hadn't said or done anything to suggest any warmth towards us, Madame now appeared to me like an intimate, someone much closer to us than anyone knew we had met over the recent years. That's why suddenly all the things I had been preparing in my head just went and I spoke to her honestly and simply, almost as I might have done years ago to a guardian. I told her what we had heard and the rumors about the Hailsham students and deferrals and how we realized the rumors might not be accurate that we weren't banking on anything and even if it's true i said we know you must get tired of it of it all these couples coming to you claiming to be in love tommy and me we never would have come and bothered you if we weren't really sure sure it was the first time she had spoken in for ages and we both jolted back in a bit of a surprise. You say you were sure, sure that you are in love. How can you know it? You think love is so simple? So you are in love, deeply in love. Is that what you are saying to me? Her voice sounded almost sarcastic. But, when I, but then I saw with a kind of shock, little tears in her eyes as she looked from one to the other of us. You believe this? that you are deeply in love and therefore you have come to me for this this deferral why why did you come to me if she asked this in a certain way like the whole idea was completely crazy then i am sure i would have felt pretty de devastated but she hadn't quite said it like that she asked it almost like it was a test question she knew the answer to as if even she had taken other couples through an, an identical routine many times. That was what kept me hopeful. But Tommy must have got anxious because he suddenly burst in. We, we came to see you because of your gallery. We think we know what your gallery is for. My gallery? She leaned back on the window ledge, causing the curtains to sway behind her and took a slow breath. My gallery. You must mean my collection. All those paintings, poems, all those things of yours I gathered over the years. It was hard work for me, but I believed in it. We all did in those days. 
So you think you know what it was for, why we did it? Well, that would be the most interesting to hear. Because I have to say, it's a question I ask myself all the time. She suddenly gazed, switched her gaze from Tommy to me. Did I go too far? She asked. I didn't know what to say. So just replied, no, no. I go too far, she said. I'm sorry. I often go too far on this subject. Forget what I just said, young man. You were going to tell me about my gallery. Please let me hear it. It's so you could tell, Tommy said. So you would have something to go on. Otherwise, how would you know when students come to you and say that they are in love? Madame's gaze had drifted over to me again and I had the feeling that she was staring at something on my arm. I actually looked down to see if there was some bird shit or something on my sleeve. Then I heard, then I heard her say, And that is why you think I gathered all those things of yours? My gallery? As you would call it? I laugh when I first heard that's what you are calling it. But in time, I too come to think of it as that. My gallery. Now why, young man? Explain it to me. Why would my gallery help in telling which one of you, which of you are really in love? Because it would help show what we were like, Tommy said. Because, because of course, Madame cut in suddenly. Your art will reveal your inner selves. That's it, isn't it? Because your art will display your souls. Then suddenly she turned to me and again and said, I go too far? She said this before and I again had the impression she was staring at a spot on my sleeve but by this point a faint suspicion I had ever since the first time asked she had asked I go too far had started to grow. I looked at Madame carefully but she seemed to sense my scrutiny and turned back to Tommy. Alright, she said. Let us continue. What was it you were telling me? The trouble is, Tommy said, I was a bit mixed up in those days. You were saying something about your art, how art bears the soul of the artist. Well, what I'm trying to say, Tommy persisted, is that I was so mixed up in those days, I didn't really do any art. I didn't do anything. And now, I know now I should have done, but I was mixed up. So you haven't gotten anything of mine in your gallery. I know it's my fault, and I know it's probably way too late. But I've brought some things with me now. He raised his back and then began un to unzip it. Some of it was done recently, and some of it was quite from quite long ago. You should have Kath stuff already. She's got plenty of into the gallery, didn't you, Kath? For a moment, they were both looking at me, and then Madame said, barely audible, Poor creatures, what did we do to you with all your schemes and plans? She let that hang, and I thought I could see tears in her eyes again. Then she turned to me and said, Do we continue with this talk? You wish to go on? It was when she said this, the vague idea that I had before became something more substantial. Do I go too far? And now do we continue? I realized with a little chill that these questions were ne never been for me or for Tommy, but for someone else, someone listening behind us in the darkness half of the room. I turned around quite slowly and looked into the darkness. I couldn't see anything, but I heard a sound. A mechanical one, surprisingly far away in the house, seemed to go much further back into the dark than I guessed. Then I could make out a shape moving towards us. A, vo a woman's voice said, Yes, Marie Claude, let us carry on. I was still looking into the darkness when I heard Madame let out a kind of snort, and she came striding past us and into the dark. Then, there were more mechanical sounds, and Madame emerged, pushing a figure in a wheelchair. She passed between us again, and for a moment longer, 
I, because Madame's back was blocking the view, I couldn't see the person in the wheelchair. But then Madame steered it around to face us and said, You speak to them. It's you they have come to speak to. I suppose it is. The figure in the wheelchair was frail and contorted, and it was her voice that more than anything that helped me recognize her. Miss Emily, Tommy said quite softly. You speak to them, Madame said, as though washing her hands off everything, but she remained standing behind the wheelchair, her eyes blazing towards us. Chapter 22 We're almost done! Chapter 22 Never let me go Marie Claude is correct Miss Emily said I'm the one whom you should be speaking Marie Claude worked very hard for our project and the way it ended has left her feeling somewhat disillusioned. As for myself, whatever the, 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 whatever the disappointments, I don't feel so badly about it. I think what we achieved merits some respect. Look at the two of you. You have turned out so well. I'm sure you have much you could tell me to make me proud. What did you say your names were? No, no. Wait, I think I shall remember. You're the boy with a bad temper. A bad temper, but a big heart. Tommy, am I right? And you, of course, are Cathy H. You have done well as a carer. We have heard a lot about you. I remember you, see? I dare say I can remember you all. What good does it do you or them? Madame asked, then strode away from the wheelchair, past the two of us and into the darkness, and for all I know, to occupy the space Miss Emily had been in before. Miss Emily, I said, it's very nice to see you again. How kind of you to say so. I recognize you, but you may not well recognize me. In fact, Cathy H., once, not so long ago, I passed you sitting on that bench over there and you certainly didn't recognize me then you glance at george the big nigerian man pushing me oh yes you've got quite a good look at him and he at you i didn't say a single word and you didn't know it was me but tonight in context as it were we know each other you both look rather shocked at the sight of me i have not been well recently but i am hoping this contraption isn't permanently fixture fixture. Unfortunately, my dears, I won't be able to entertain you for as long as I would like just now, because in a short while, some men are coming to take away my bedside cabinet. It's quite a wonderful object. George has put protective padding around it, but I've insisted I'll accompany it myself all the same. You never know with this man. They handle it roughly and hurl it around their vehicles and their employers claim that it was like that from the start. It happened to us before, so this time, I have insisted on going along with it. It's a beautiful object. I had it with me at Hailsham, so I am determined to get a fair price. So when you co when they come, I'm afraid that that's when I have to leave you. But I can see, my dears. You have come on a mission close to my heart, to your hearts. I must say, it does cheer me up to see you. And it cheers Mary Claude too, even though you would never know it to look at her. Isn't that so, darling? So she pretends it's not so, but it is. She has touched that, she's touched that you have come to find us. Oh, she's in sulk. Ignore her, students, ignore her. Now, I'll try to answer your questions as best as I can. I've heard this rumor countless of times. When we were still at Hailsham, we'd get one or three couples each year trying to talk, get in to talk to us. One even wrote to us, I suppose it's not so hard to find a large estate like that if you mean to break the rules. So, you see, it's been there, this rumor, from long before your time. She stopped, so I said, What we want to know, Miss Emily, as 
is if the rumor true rumors true or not she went on gazing at us for a moment then took a deep breath we didn't hail Shem itself who whenever this talk started up i'll make sure to stamp it out good and proper but as for what students said after they had left us what could i what could i do in the end i came to believe and marie claude believes this too don't you darling what i mean is i think it's one that gets created from scratch over and over you go to the store the source stamp it out you will not stop it starting elsewhere again i've I came to this conclusion and ceased to worry about it. Marie Claude never did worry about it. Her views was, if they are so foolish, let them believe it. Oh yes, don't show me that sour face of yours. That's your view of it from the beginning. After many years of it, I have came not exactly to the same viewpoint, but I began to think, well, perhaps I shouldn't worry. It's not my doing after all. And for the few couples who get disappointed, the rest will never put it to the test anyway. It's something for them to dream about, a little fantasy. What's harm in there? But for the two of you, I can see that this doesn't apply. You are serious. You have thought carefully. You have hoped carefully. For students like you, I do feel regret. It gives me no pleasure at all to disappoint you, but there it is. I didn't want to look at Tommy. I felt surprising, surprisingly calm, and even though Miss Emily's words should have crushed us, there was an aspect to them that implied something further, something being held back, that suggested we hadn't yet got to the bottom of things. There was even the possibility she wasn't telling the truth. So I asked, Is it the case, then, that deferrals don't exist? There's nothing you can do. She shook her head slowly from side to side. There's no truth in the rumor. I am sorry. I truly am. Suddenly, Tommy asked, Was it true once though, before Hailsham closed? Miss Emily went on shaking her head. It was never true. Even before the Morningdale scandal, even back when Hailsham was considered a shining beacon, an example of how we might move to a more humane and better way of doing things, even then it wasn't true. It's the best, it's best to be clear about this, a wishful rumor. That's all it ever was. Oh dear, is that the man who come for the cabinet? The doorbell had gone, and the footsteps came down the stairs to answer it and there were men's voices out in the narrow hall and madame came out of the darkness behind us crossed the room and went out miss emily leaned forward in the wheelchair listening intently then she said it's not them it's an awful man from the decorating company again marie claude will see to it so my dears we have a few more m minutes more was there something else you wish to talk to me about this is all strictly against regulations, of course, but Anne-Marie Claude should never have asked you in, and naturally, I should have turned you out the second I knew you were here, but Marie Claude doesn't care much for their regulations these days, and I must say, neither do I. So, if you wish to stay a bit longer, you are very much welcome. If the, if the rumor was never true, Tommy said, then why did you all take our stuff, art stuff away? Didn't the gallery exist either? The gallery? Well, that rumor did have some truth to it. There was a gallery. And after a fashion, there still is. These days, it's here, in this house. I had to prune it down, which I regret. But there wasn't room for all, all, all of it in here. But why did we take your work away? That's what you are asking, isn't it? Not just that, I said quietly. Why did we do all that, all of that work in the first place? Why train us, encourage us, make us produce all of that if you are just going to give donations anyway and then die? And why all those lessons? Why all those books and discussions? Why Hailsham at all? Madame had said this from the from the hallway. She came past us again, and back into the darkened section of the room. It's a good question for you to ask. 
Miss Emily's gaze followed her and for a moment remained fixed behind us. I felt the turning to see wh what looks were being exchanged, but it was almost like we were back at Hailsham and we had to keep facing front with complete attention. Then Miss Emily said, Yes, why Hailsham at all? Marie Claude likes to ask that a lot these days, but not so long ago before the Morningdale scandal. She wouldn't have dreamt of asking questions like that. It wouldn't have entered her head. You know that's right. Don't look at me like that. There was only one person in those days who would ask questions like that, and that was me. Long before Morningdale, right from the very beginning, I asked that. And that made it easy for the rest of them. Marie Claude, all of the rest of them, they could all carry on without a care. All you students too. I did all the worrying and questioning for the lot of you. And as long as I was steadfast, th then no doubts ever crossed your minds. Any of you. But you ask your questions, dear boy. Let's answer the simplest one. And perhaps it will answer all of the rest. Why did we take your artwork? Why did we do that? You said an interesting thing earlier, Tommy. You were discussing this with Ma Miss Marie Claude. You said it was because your art would reveal what you were like. What you were like inside. That's what you said, wasn't it? Well, you weren't far wrong about that. We took away your art because we thought it would reveal your souls. Or to put it more finely, we did it to prove you had souls at all. She paused. And Tommy and I exchanged glances for the first time in ages, and then I asked, Why did you have to prove things like that, Miss Emily? Did someone think that we didn't have souls? A thin smile appeared on her face. It's touching, Kathy, to see you so taken aback. It demonstrates in a way that we did our job well. As you say, why would anyone doubt that you had a soul? But I have to tell you, my dear, it wasn't something commonly held when we first set out all those years ago. And though we have come a long way since then, it's still not a notion universally held even today. You, Hilsham students, even after you have been out in the world like this, you still don't know half of it. All around the country, at this very moment, there are students being reared in deplorable conditions. Conditions you Hilsham students could hardly imagine. And now we are no more. Things will only get worse. She paused again, and for a moment, she seemed to be inspecting us carefully through the narrow eyes. Finally, she went on. Wherever else, we at least saw to it all that all of you in our care, you grew up in wonderful surroundings. And we saw it too. After you left us, you were kept away from the worst of the horrors. We were able to do that much for you at least. But this dream of yours, this dream of being able to, de to defer, such a thing would have always been beyond us to grant, even at the height of our influence. I am sorry. I can see that, I can see what I'm saying won't be welcome to you, but you must not be dejected. I hope you can appreciate how much we were able to secure for you. Look at the both of you now. You've got good lives. You were educated and cultured. I'm sorry we couldn't secure more for you than we did, but you must realize how much worse things once were. When Marie Claude and I started out, there were no places at like Hailsham in existence. We were the first along the Glen Morgan house. Then a few years later, the Saunders Trust. Together, we, we became a small but very vocal movement. And we challenged the entire way the donation program was being run. Most importantly, we demonstrated to the world that if students were reared in humane, cultivated environment, environments, it was possible for them to grow to be sens as sensitive and intelligent as any ordinary human being. Before that, all clones, or students as we prefer to call you, existed only to supply medical science. In the early days after the war, that's largely all of you were to most people shadowy objects in test tubes. 
Wouldn't you agree, Marie Claude? She's being very quiet. Usually you can't get her to shut up on this subject. Your presence, my dear, appeared to have tied her tongue. Very well. So to answer your question, Tommy, that was why we collected your art. We selected the best of it and put it on special exhibitions in the late 70s at the height of our influence. We were organizing large events all over around the world. There will be cabinet ministers, uh, sorry, cabinet ministers, bishops, all sort of famous people coming to attend. There were speeches, large funds pledged. There, look, we could say, look at this art. How dare you claim these children are anything less than f fully human? Oh yes, there was a lot of support for our movement back then. The tide was with us. For the next few minutes, Miss Emily went on reminiscing about different events from those days, mentioning a lot of people names, whose names meant nothing to us. In fact, for a moment, it sound, it's almost like we were listening to her again in one of her morning assemblies as she drifted off on tangents none of us could follow. She seemed to enjoy herself though, and a gentle smile settled around her eyes. Then, suddenly, she came out of it and said in a new tone, but we never la never quite lost touch with reality, did we, Marie Claude? Not like our colleagues at the Saunders Trust. Even during the best of times, we always knew what a difficult battle we were engaged in. And sure enough, the Morningdale business came along and then one or two other things. And before we knew it, all our hard work had become undone. But what I don't understand, I said. It's why people want students being treated so badly in the first place. From your perspective today, Kathy, your bemusement is perfectly reasonable. But you must try to see it historically. After the war, in the early 50s, when the great breakthrough in science followed one after the other so rapidly, there wasn't time to take stock, to ask the sensible questions. Suddenly, there were these new possibilities laid before us, all these ways to cure so many previously incurable conditions. This was what the world noticed the most and wanted the most, and for a long time, people preferred to believe these organs appeared out of nowhere, or, or at most, they grew in some, some kind of a vacuum. Yes, there were arguments, but by the time people become concerned about, about students by the time they came to consider just how you were reared whether you have you should have come so whether you should have been brought into existence at all well by then it was too late there was no way to reverse the process how can you ask a world that has come to regard cancer as curable how can you ask such a world to put away that cure and to go back to the dark days there was no going back however comfortable people are about your existence their overwhelming concern was that their own children their spouses their parents their friends did not die from cancer motor neuron disease heart disease so for a long time you were kept in the shadows and people did their best not to think of you and if they did they tried to convince themselves you weren't really like us that you were less than human so it didn't matter and that was how things stood until our little movement came along. But did you see what we were up against? We were virtually attempting to square the circle. Here was the world requiring students to donate. What the re while that remained the case, that there would be there would always be a barrier against seeing you as properly human. Well, we fought that battle for many for many years. And what we want for you, at least, were many improvements. Though, of course, you were only a select few. But then came the Morningdale scandal and the other things, and before we knew it, the climate has quite changed. No one wanted to be supporting us anymore, and our little movement, Hailsham, Glen Morgan, the Saunders Trust, we were all, we were all of us swept away. What was this Morningdale scandal you kept mentioning, Miss Emily? I asked. You'll have to tell us because we don't know about it. Well, I suppose there's no reason why you should. It was never such a large matter in the wider world. 
is quite is concerned a scientist named James Morningdale, quite talented in his way. He carried he carried on his work in a remote part of Scotland, where I suppose he thought he would attract less attention. What he wanted to offer people the possibility of having children with enhanced characteristics, superior intelligence, superior athleticism, that sort of thing. Of course, there have been others with similar ambitions, but this Morningdale fellow, he had taken his research much further than anyone before him, far beyond boundaries, legal boundaries. Well, he was discovered, and they put an end to his work, and that seemed to that, except of course, it wasn't, not for us. As I say, it never became an enormous matter, but it did create a certain atmosphere, you see. It reminded people, it reminded them of the fear that had they always had. It's one thing to create students, such as yourself, for the donation program, but a generation of children who would take their place in society? Children demonstrate demonstrably superior to the rest of us oh no that frightens people they recoil from that but miss emily i said what did that what did any of that have to do with us what did hailsham have to close because of something like that we didn't see an obvious connection either kathy not at first and i often think of it now we were culpable not to do so have we been more alert, less absorbed with ourselves if we worked very hard at the stage when the news came out about Morningdale first broke? We might have been able to avert it. Oh, Marie Claude disagrees. She thinks it would have happened no matter what we did, and she might have a point. After all, it wasn't just Morningdale. There were other things at the time. That awful television series, for instance, all these things contributed contributed to the turning of the tide. But I suppose, when it comes down to it, the central flaw was this. Our little movement, we were always too fragile, always too dependent on the whims of our supporters. So long as the climate was in our favor, so long as, as a corporation or a politician could see the benefit in supporting us, then we were able to keep afloat. But it had been a struggle, and after morning day, but it had always been a struggle, and after morning day, after the climate change, we had no chance. The world, the world didn't want to be reminded how the donation program really worked. They didn't want to think about you students and about the conditions you were brought up in. In other words, my dears, they wanted you back in the shadows, back in the shadows where the you had been before the likes of Marie Claude and myself ever come ever came along, and all those influential people who had once been so keen to help us, of course, they all vanished. We lost our sponsors one after another in a matter of just a year. We kept going for as long as we could. We went on for two years before then Glen Morgan. Then, but in the end, as you know, we were obliged to close, and today there's hardly any trace of work of, of the work left. Sorry, hardly any trace left of the work we did. You won't find anything like Hailsham anywhere in the country now. All you will find, as ever, are those vast government homes, and even if they are somewhat better than they, they were once were. Let me tell you, my dears, you would not sleep for days if you saw what goes on in some of those places. And as for Marie Claude and me, here we are. We have retreated to, the, to this house. Upstairs, we have a mountain of your works. That's, that's what we have to remind us of what we did. And a mountain of that too, though that's not nearly so welcome. And the memories, I suppose, of all of you, and the knowledge that we have given you better lives than you would have had otherwise. Don't try to, don't try and ask them to thank you, Madame's voice said from behind us. Why shouldn't? Why should they be grateful? They came here looking for something much more. What we gave them all these years, all the fighting we did on their behalf. What do they know of that? They think it's God-given. Until they came here, they knew nothing of it. All they feel now is disappointment because we haven't given them everything possible. 
Nobody spoke for a while. Then there was noise outside and the doorbell rang again. Madame came out of the darkness and went out into the hall. This time it must be the man, Miss Emily said. I shall get I shall have to get ready. But you can stay a little longer. The men have to bring the things down two flights of the stairs. Marie Claude will see they don't damage it. Tommy and I couldn't quite believe that was the end of it. Neither of us stood up. Anyway, there was no sign of anyone helping Miss Emily out of her wheelchair, and I wondered for a moment if she was going to try to get up by herself, but she remained still, leaning forward as before, listening intently. Then Tommy said, So, there's definitely nothing. No deferral? Nothing like that? Tommy, I murmured. I glared at him, but Miss Emily said gently, No, Tommy, there's nothing like that. Your life must now run the course that's been set for it. So what you're saying, Miss, Tommy said, is that everything we did, all the lessons, everything, it was all about what you just told us. There's nothing more to it than that. I can see, Miss Emily said, that it might look as though you were simply pawns in a game. It can certainly be look like that, but, it, but think of it. You were lucky pawns. There were a certain climate, and now it's gone. You have to accept that sometimes that's how things happen in the world. People's opinion, their feelings, they go one way than the other. It just so happens you grew up at a certain point in this process. It might be just some trend that came and went, I said, but for us it's our life. Yes, that's true. But think of it. You are better off than many who came before you and who knows what those who, what those who come after you will have to face i'm sorry students but i have to leave you now george george there had been a lot of noise in the hallway and perhaps this has stopped george from hearing because there was no response tommy, tommy suddenly asked is that why miss lucy left for a while, I thought Miss Emily, whose attention was on what was going on in the hallway, hadn't heard him. She leaned back in her wheelchair and began moving it gradually towards the door. There were so many little coffee tables and chairs that didn't seem to seem a way through. I was about to get up and clear a path when she suddenly stopped. Lucy Wainwright, she said. Ah, yes. We had a little trouble with her. She paused, then adjusted her wheelchair back to face Tommy. Yes, we had a little trouble with her. A disagreement. But to answer your question, Tommy, the disagreement with Lucy Wainwright wasn't to do with what I have just told you. Not directly, anyway. No, that was more, shall we say, an internal matter? I thought she was going to leave it at that, so I asked, Miss Emily, if it's alright, we will let you know about it, about what happened to Miss Lucy. Miss Emily raised her eyebrows. Lucy Wainwright. She was important to you? Forgive me, students. I'm forgetting again. Lucy wasn't with us for, for long. So for us, she is just a peripheral figure in our memory of Hailsham, and not a, an altogether happy one. But I appreciate if you were there during those years. She laughed to herself and seemed to be remembering something something. In the hall, Madame was telling the men off really loudly, but Miss Emily now seemed to have lost interest. She was going through her memories with a look of concentration. Finally, she said, she was a nice girl, nice enough girl, Lucy Wainwright. But after she had been with us for a while, she began to have these ideas. She thought you students had to be made more aware, more aware of what lay ahead of you who you were, what you were for. She believed you should be given a full, as full picture as possible. That to, that to do anything less would be somehow to cheat you. We considered her view and concluded that she was, she has, she was mistaken. Why? Tommy asked. Why did you think that? Why? She meant well. I'm sure of that. I can see you are very fond of her. She had the makings of an intellect in Guardian, but what she was wanting to do, it was too theoretical. 
We had we had run Hailsham for many years, and we had a sense of what could work, what was best for the students in the long run beyond Hailsham. Lucy Wainwright was idealistic. Nothing wrong with that, but she has no grasp of practicalities. You see, we were able to give you something, something which, even now, no one will ever take from you, and you were able to do that principally by sheltering you, Hailsham. Would not have Hailsham if he we hadn't very well. Sometimes that mean that meant we kept things from you, lied to you. Yes, in many ways we fooled you. I suppose you could even call it that. But we sheltered you during the, those years, and we gave your ch- and we gave your childhoods. Lucy was well-meaning enough, but if she hadn't had her way, your happiness at Hailsham would have been shattered. Look at the both of you now. I'm so proud to see you both. You built your lives on what we gave you, and you wouldn't be who you are today if we had not protected you. You wouldn't have absorbed, been so absorbed in your lessons. You wouldn't have lost yourself in your art and your writing. What should you have done, knowing what lay in store for each of you? You would have told us it was all pointless. But how could we have argued with you? So she had to go. We could hear Madame now shouting at the man. She hadn't lost her temper exactly, but her voice was frighteningly stern, and the man's voices, which until at this point had been arguing with her, fell silent. Perhaps it's just as well I remained here with you, Miss Emily said. Marie Claude does this sort of thing so much more efficiently. I don't know what made me say it. Maybe it was because I knew the visit would have to finish pretty soon. Maybe I was getting curious to know exactly how exactly Miss Emily and Madame felt about each other. Anyway, I said to her, lowering my voice and nodding towards the doorway, "Madame never liked us. She has always been afraid of us, in the way people are afraid of spiders and things." I waited to see if Miss Emily would get angry, no longer caring much if she did. Sure enough, she turned to me sharply, as if I had thrown a ball, a ball of paper at her, and her eyes flashed in a way that reminded me of the, her Hailsham days. But her voice was even and soft when she replied, "Marie Claude has given everything for you. She has worked and worked and worked. Make no mistakes about it, my child." Marie Claude was on your side and will will always be on your side. Is she afraid of you? We are all afraid of you. I myself have to fight back my dread of you all almost every day when I was at Hailsham. There were times I would look down at you from all. Look down at you all from my study window, and I felt such revulsion. She stopped, and then something in her eyes flashed again. But I was determined not to let such feelings stop me from doing what was right. I fought those feelings, and I won. Now, if you'd be so good as to help me out here, George should be waiting with my crutches. With us at the el- at each elbow, she walked carefully into the hall, where a large man in nursing uniform started with a- with alarm and quickly produced a pair of crutches. The front door was open to the street, and I saw. So- And I, I was surprised to see there was still daylight left. Madame's voice was coming from outside, talking more calmly now to, to to the man. It felt like time for Tommy and me to slip away, but George man, but the George man was helping Miss Emily with her coat while she stood steadily between her crutches. There was no way we could get past, so we just waited. I suppose, too, we were waiting to say goodbye to Miss Emily. Maybe after everything else. We wanted to thank her. I'm not sure, but she is now preoccupied with her cabinet. She began to make urgent points to the men outside, and then left with George, not looking back at us. Tommy and I stayed in the hall for a while longer, not sure what to do. But eventually, we did wander outside and noticed the lamps had come on all the way down the long street, even though the sky wasn't yet dark. A white van was starting up its engine. Right behind was a big old Volvo with Miss Emily in the passenger seat. Madame was crouching by the window, nodding to something Miss Emily was saying, while George closed up the boot and moved around to the driver's door. 
Then the white van moved off and Miss Emily's car followed. Madame watched the departing vehicles for a long time. Then she turned as though to back to the house and seeing us on there on the pavement, stopped abruptly, almost shrinking back. We are going now, I said. Thank you for talking to us. Please say goodbye to Miss Emily for us. I could see her studying me in the fading light. Then she said, Kathy H., I remember you. Yes, I remember. She fell silent, but went on looking at me. I think I know what you are, th what you are thinking about, I said in the, in the end. I think I can guess. Very well. Her voice was dreamy, and the gaze had slightly lost focus. Very well. You are a mind reader. Tell me. There was a time you saw me once, one afternoon in the dormitories. There was no one else and I was playing this tape, this music. I was sort of dancing with my eyes closed and you saw me. That's very good. A mind reader. You should be on the stage. I only recognized you just now. But yes, I remember that occasion. I still think about it from time to time. That's funny. So do I. I see. We could have ended the conversation there. We could have said goodbye and left, but she stepped closer to us, looking into my face all the time. You were much younger then, she said, but yes, it's you. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to, I said, but it's always puzzled me. May I ask you? You read my mind, but I cannot read yours. Well, you were upset that day. You were watching me, and I realized when I opened my eyes, you were watching me, and I think you were crying. In fact, I know you were. You were watching me and crying. Why was that? Madame's expression didn't change, and she kept staring into my face. I was weeping, she said eventually, very quietly, as though afraid the neighbors were listening. Because when I came in, I heard your music, and I thought... Some foolish student had left music on. But when I came into your dormitory and I saw you by yourself, a little girl dancing, as you say, eyes closed, far away, looking of yearn a look of yearning. You were dancing so sympathetically. And the music, the song, there was something in the words. It was full of sadness. The song, I said, it was called Never Let Me Go. Then I sang a couple of lines quietly under my breath for her. She nodded as though in agreement. Yes, it was that song. I've heard it once or twice since then on the radio, on television. It's taken me back to that little girl dancing by herself. You say that you're not a mind reader, I said, but maybe you were that day. Maybe that's why you started crying when you saw me. Because whatever that song was really about in my head when I was dancing, I had my own version. You see, I imagine it was about this woman who had been told that she couldn't have babies. And then she had one and when she was so pleased and she was holding it ever so tightly to her breast, really afraid something might separate them. And she's going, baby, baby, never let me go. That's not what the song is about. But that's what I had in my mind at that time. Maybe you read my mind, and that's why you found it so sad. I didn't think it was so sad at that time, but now, when I think back, it does feel a bit sad. I had spoken to Madame, but I could sense Tommy shifting next to me, and was aware of the texture of his clothes, of everything about him. Then Madame said, That's most interesting. But I was no more a mind reader then than today. I was weeping for an altogether different reason when i watched you dancing that day i saw something else i saw the new world coming rapidly more scientific efficient yes more cures from the old for the old sicknesses very good but a harsh cruel world when i saw a little girl her eyes tightly closed holding to her breast an old kind of world one that she knew in her heart could not remain and she was holding it and pleading I never let her go. That is what I saw. It wasn't re really you. What you were doing, I know that. But I saw. But I saw you and it broke my heart and I have never forgotten. Then she came forward. Until 
she was only a step or two away from us. Your stories this evening, they touched me too. She looked now to Tommy, then back at me. Poor creatures. I wish I could help you. But now, you're by yourselves. She reached out her hand, all the while staring into my face, and placed it on my cheek. I could feel a trembling go all through her body, but she kept her hand where it was, and I could see her tears appearing in her eyes again. You poor creatures, she repeated, almost in a whisper, then she turned and walked back into her house. We hardly discussed our meeting with Miss Emily and Madame on the journey back, or if we did, we talked only about the less important things like how much we thought they had age or the stuff in their house. I kept us on the most obscure back roads I knew where only our headlights disturbed the darkness. We had occasionally encountered other headlights and then I would get the feeling they belonged to other carers. Driving home alone, or maybe like me with a donor beside them, I realized, of course, that other people use these roads. But at night, it seemed to me that these dark byways of the country existed just for the likes of us, while the big glittering motorways with their huge signs and super cafes were for everyone else. I don't know if Tommy was thinking something simil similar, but maybe he was, because at some point he remarked, "Cass, you really know some weird roads." He did a little laugh as he said this, but then he seemed to fall deep into thoughts. Then as we go as we were going at, down a particular dark lane in the back of the nowhere, he suddenly said, I think Miss Lucy was right, not Miss Emily. I can't think if I said anything to that, and if I did, it certainly wasn't anything. Very profound. But that was the moment I first noticed it. Something in his voice or maybe in his manner, the set of distant, uh, distant alarm bells. I remember taking my eyes off the twisting roads to glance at him, but he was just sitting there quietly, gazing straight ahead into the night. A few minutes later, he said suddenly, Cass, can we stop? I'm sorry, I need to get out a minute. Thinking that he was feeling sick again, I pulled up almost immediately, hard against the hedge. The spot was completely unlit, and even with the car light on, I was nervous another vehicle might come around and curve and run into us. That's why, when Tommy got out and disappeared into the darkness, <clears throat> into, da into the darkness, I didn't go with him. Also, there had been something purposeful about the way he had got out that suggested that even if he was feeling ill, he'd rather cope with it in his own way. Anyway... That's why I was still in the car, wondering whether to move it a little further up the hill when I heard the first scream. At first, I didn't even think it was him, but some maniac who has been lurking in the bushes. I was already out of the car when the second and the third scream came, and by then, I knew it was Tommy, though that hardly lessened my urgency. In fact, for a moment, I was probably close to panic. Not having a clue where he was, I couldn't really see anything. And I tried to go towards the scream. I was stopped by, in, by an impenetrable thicket. And then, I found an opening. And stepping through a ditch, there come to a fence. I managed to climb over it and land in some soft mud. I could see now my surroundings much better. I was in a field that sloped steeply not far in front of me and I could see the light of some village way below in the valley. The wind here was really powerful and a gust pulled at me so hard I had to reach for the fence post. The moon wasn't quite full, but it was bright enough, and I could make out in the mid-distance, near where the field began to fall away, Tommy's figure raging, shouting, flinging his fist and kicking rout. I tried to run to him, but the mud sucked my feet down. The mud was impeding him too, but because one time when he, when he kicked out, he slipped and fell out of view into the blackness, but his jumbled swear words continued uninterrupted and I was able to reach him just as he was getting back on his feet again. I caught a glimpse of his face in the moonlight, caked in mud and distorted in fury, then I reached for his failing arm and held it tight. He tried to shake me off but I kept holding on until he stopped shouting and I felt the fight to get go out of him. Then I realized too, 
He too had his arms around me, and we stood together like that at the top of the field for what it seems like ages, not saying anything, just holding each other, while the wind kept blowing and blowing at us, tugging our clothes, and for a moment it seemed like we were holding on each other because that was the only way to stop us from being swept away into the night. When at last we pulled apart, he muttered, I'm really sorry, Kath. Then he gave a shaky laugh and added, Good job there wasn't any cows in the field. They would have gotten a fright. I could see he was doing his best to reassure me that it was all okay now, but his chest was still heaving and his leg shaking. We walked together back to the car, trying not to sleep. You stink of cow poo, I said finally. Oh god, Kath, how do I explain this? We'll have to sneak in round the back. You still have to sign in. Oh god, he said la and laughed again. I found some rags in the car and got the worst of the muck off, but I had taken out the boot just, oh, just while I was searching for the rags. The spots back containing the animal pictures, and when we set off again, I noticed Tommy brought it inside with him. We traveled some way, not saying much. The bag on his lap. I was travel. I was waiting for him to say something about the picture. It was a. It it even occurred to me that he was working up to another rage when he threw all the pictures out of the window. But when he held the bag protectively with both of his hands and kept staring in the dark unfolding before us, after a long period of silence, he said, "I'm sorry about what. I'm sorry about just now, Kath. I really am. I'm a real idiot." Then he said. He added, "What are you thinking, Kath?" I was thinking, I said, about back then at Hailsham, when you used to go bonkers like that, and we couldn't understand it. We couldn't, we couldn't understand how you could ever get like that. And I was just having this idea, just a thought, really. I was thinking maybe the reason you used to get like this was because at some level, you always knew. Tommy thought about this, then shook his head. Don't think so, Kath. No. It was just me, just always just me, me being an idiot, that's all it ever was. Then after a moment, he did a small laugh and said, but that's a funny idea, maybe I didn't know, somewhere inside, deep down, something the, re the rest of you didn't. Now we are closing up the book with chapter 23. Last chapter. Part 3, chapter 23 of Never Let Me Go. We are ending the stream after this next chapter. One sip of coffee and we shall start. Chapter 23. Nothing seemed to change much in the week or so after the trip. I didn't expect it to stay that way mu that way though. And sure enough, by the start of October, I started to notice little differences. For one thing though, Tommy carried on with his animal pictures. He became cagey about doing them in my presence. We weren't quite back to how it was when I, I had first become his carer, and all the cottager staff was still hanging over us. But it was like he had thought about it and become and come to a decision that he, he would continue with the animals as the mood took him. But if I came in, he would stop and put them away. I wasn't that hurt by this. In fact, in many ways, it was a relief. Those animals staring us in the face when we were together would have only made things more awkward. But there were other changes I found less easy. I don't mean we weren't still having some good times up in his room. We were having sex every now and then, but what I couldn't help noticing was how, more and more, Tommy tended to identify himself with other donors at the centers. If, for instance, the two of us reminiscing old Hailsham people, he would sooner or later move to the conversation round to one of his current donor friends who had maybe said or done something similar to what we were recalling. There was once, in part one time in particular, when I drove 
into the king's field after a long journey and stepped out of the car, the square was looking a bit like that like that time I had come to the center with Ruth the afternoon we had gone to see the boat. It was the overcast autumn afternoon and there was no one about except for a group of donors clustered under the overhanging of the roof of the recreation bu building. I saw Tommy was with them. He was standing with his shoulder against the post and was listening to a donor who was sitting crouched on the entrance steps. I came towards them a little way, then stopped and waited. That was in the open, under the grey sky. But Tommy, though he had seen me, went on listening to his friends, and eventually he and all the others burst out laughing. Even then, he had carried on listening and smiling. He claimed afterward that he had signaled me to come over. But if he had, it hadn't been at all obvious. All I registered was him smiling vaguely into my direction, then going back to his what his friends were saying. Okay? He was in the middle of something, and after a minute or so, he he did come away, and the two of us went up to his room. But it was quite different from the way things would have been, would have happened before, and if, and it wasn't just that he had kept me waiting out in the square. I wouldn't have minded that much. It was more that I sensed, for the first time that day. Something close to resentment on his part at having to come away with me, and once we were up to his room, the atmosphere between us wasn't so great. To be fair, a lot of it might have been down to me as much as him, because I would stood there, watching them all talking and laughing, I had felt this unexpected little tug, because there was something about the way these donors had arranged themselves in a rough semicircle. Something about their poses almost studiedly relaxed, whether standing or sitting, as though to announce to the world how much each one of them were savoring the company. That reminded me of our little gang used to sit around in pavilion together. That comparison, as I say, tucked something inside me, and so maybe once we were up to in, in his room, it was much as much as me feeling resentful as the other way round. I had felt a similar little prickle of resentment each time he told me I didn't understand something or other because I wasn't yet a donor. But apart from one particular time, which I'll come in in a moment, a little prickle was all it was. Usually he would say these things to me half-jokingly, almost affectionately, and even when there was something more to it, like the time he told me to stop taking his dirty washings to the laundry because he could do it himself it's hardly amounted to a row that time i i had asked him what difference does it make which one of us takes the towels down i'm going to go i'm going out that way anyway to which he has shaken his head and said look Kath, i'll sort out my own things if you are a donor you will see okay it did niggle but it was something i could forget easily but as i say there was this one time he brought it up and about about my not being a donor that really riled me up. It happened about a week after the notice came for his fourth donation and we had been expecting it and had already talked it through a lot. In fact, we had had some of our most intimate conversations since the Little Hampton trip discussing about the fourth donation. I've known donors to react in all sort of way to their fourth donation. Some want to talk about it all the time endlessly and pointlessly. Others will only joke about it, while others refuse to discuss it at all. And there's this odd tendency among donors to treat a fourth donation as something worthy of congratulation. A donor on the fourth, even one with who has been pretty unpopular up till then, is treated with a special respect. Even the doctors and nurses play up this a lot. A donor on the fourth will go on in a, for a check and will be greeted by white coats smiling and shaking their hands. Well, Tommy and I, we talk about all of this, sometimes jokingly, other times seriously and carefully. And we discuss all the different ways people tried to handle it and which ways made the best sense. Once laying side by side on the bed with the dark coming on, he said, You know why it is, Kath? Why everyone worries so much about the force? It's because they are not sure they will really complete. If you knew for certain you would complete, it would be easier. 
but they never tell us for sure. I have been wondering for a while if this would come up, and I have been thinking about it for how I would respond. But when it did, I couldn't find much to say. I just said, it's just a lot of rubbish, Tommy. Just talk, while well talk. It's not even worth thinking about. But Tommy would have known I have nothing to back up my words. He would have too. He would have known too. He was raising questions to which even doctors have no certain answers. You'll have heard the same talk. How maybe after the fourth donation, even if you are technically complete, you are still conscious in some way or another. How then you find there are more donations, plenty of them, and on the other side of the line, how there are no more recovery centers, no carers, no friends, how there's nothing to do except watch your remaining donation until they switch you off. It's a horror movie stuff. And most of the time, people don't want to think about it. Not the white coats, not the carers, and usually not the donors. And now and again, but now and again, a donor will bring it up as Tommy did that evening. And I wish we had talked about it as it was. After I dismissed it as rubbish, we both shrank back from the whole territory. At least, though, I knew it was on Tommy's mind after that, and I was glad that he had at least confided in me that far. What I'm saying is that all in all, I was under the impression we were dealing with the fourth donation pretty well together, and that's why I was so knocked off balance by what he came out with that day we walked around the field. The Kingsfield doesn't have much in the way of grounds. The squares obviously congregating point, con obvious congregating point, and the few bits behind the buildings look more like wasteland. The largest chunk, which the donors call the field, is a rectangle of overgrown weeds and thistles held in wire mesh fences. And the, there's always talk about turning it into proper lawn for the donors, but they haven't done it yet, even now. It might not be so peaceful even if they get, uh, get around to it, but because there's a big road nearby, all the same when donors get restless and to walk it off, that's where they tend to go, scraping through the nettles and brambles. This particular morning I was talking about, it was really foggy and I knew that the field would be soaking, but Tommy had been insistent we go there for a walk. Not surprisingly, we were the only ones there, which probably suited Tommy fine. After crashing about thickets for a few minutes, he stopped next to the fence and stared at the blank fog, blank fog on the other side. Then he said, Kathy, I don't want you to, to take this the wrong way, but I've been thinking it over a lot. Kath, I think I ought to get a different carer. In the few seconds after he said this, I realized I wasn't surprised by it at all. That in some funny way, I had been waiting for it. But I was angry all the same and didn't say anything. It's not just because the fourth donation is coming up, he said. It's not just about that. It's about it's because of stuff like that happened last week. When I had all that kidney trouble, there's going to be much more of the stuff coming. That's why I came and found you, I said. That's exactly why I came and helped you. For what's starting now, and it's what Ruth wanted too. Ruth wanted the other thing for us, Tommy said. She wouldn't necessarily wanted you to be my carer through this last bit. Tommy, I said. I suppose by now I was furious, but I kept my voice quiet and under control. I'm the one to help you. That's why I came and found you again. Ruth wanted the other thing for us, Tommy repeated. All this is something else, Kath. I don't want you to be that way in front of you. I don't want to be that way in front of you. He was looking down at the ground, a palm pressed against the wire mesh fence, and for a moment he looked like he's listening intently to the sound of the traffic somewhere beyond the fog. And then, and that was when he said it, shaking his head slightly. Ruth would have understood. She was a donor, so she would have understood. I'm not saying that she would necessarily have wanted the same thing for herself. If she had been able to, may maybe she would have wanted you to be her carer right to the end. But as she had understood about me wanting to do it differently, Kath, sometimes you just don't want to s don't see it. You don't see it because you're not a donor. It was 
when you came out with this that I turned and walked off. As I said, I've been almost prepared for the bit about not wanting me anymore as his carer, but what had really stung coming after all these other little things, like when he kept me standing in the square, was what he had said then. The, the way he divided me off yet again, not just from the other donors, but from him and Ruth. This never turned into a big, huge fight though. When I stalked off, there, was, there wasn't much else I could do other than back up to his room. And then he came up, several, came up himself several minutes later. I had cooled off by then and so had he. And we were able to have a better conversation about it. It was a bit stiff, but we made peace and even got into some some of the practicalities of changing carers. Then, as we are sitting in the dull light side by side on the, on the edge of his bed, he said to me, I don't want us to fight again, Cass, but I've been wanting to ask you this a lot. I mean, don't you get tired of being a carer? All this rest of us, we, we become donors ages ago. You have been doing this for years. Why don't you... Don't you sometimes wish calves they would hurry up and send you your notice? I shrugged. I don't mind. Anyway, it's important they are good carers. And I'm a good carer. But is it really that important? Okay. It's really nice to have a good carer. But in the end, is it really so important? The donors will donate. Will all donate. Just the same. And they will all complete. Of course it's important. A good carer makes a big difference to what a donor's life is actually like. But all this rushing about what you do... Oh, but all this rushing about you do... Rushing about you do... All this getting exhausted and being by yourself... I've been watching you. It's wearing you out. You must do, Cass. You must sometimes wish they would tell you to stop. I don't know why you don't have a word with them. Ask them why... It's been so long. Then, when I kept quiet, he said, I'm just saying, that's all. Let's not fight again. I put my head on his shoulder and said, Yeah, well, maybe it won't be long. Won't be much, long, much longer anyway. For now, I have to keep going. Even if you don't want me around, there are others who do. I suppose you're right, Kev. You're a really good carer. And you'll be the perfect one for me, too, if you, if it, if you weren't you. He did a laugh and put his arm around me, though we kept sitting side by side. Then he said, I keep thinking about this river somewhere with the water moving really fast. And these two people in the water trying to hold on to each other, holding on as hard as they can. But in the end, it's just too much. The current's too strong. They've got to let go, drift apart. That's how I think it is with us. It's a shame, Kath, because we love each other all of our life. But in the end, we can't stay together forever. When he said this, I remembered the way I held onto him that night in the windswept field on the way back from Little Hampton. I don't know if he was thinking about that too, or if he was still thinking about his rivers of strong and, and strong currents. In any case, we went on sitting like that on the side of the bed for a long time, lost in our thought. Then, in the end, I said to him, I'm sorry I blew up at you earlier. I'll talk to them. I'll try to. I'll try and see. To it, you got someone really good. It's a shame, Kath. He said again. I don't, and I don't think we talk anymore about it that morning. I remember a few weeks that come after that. The last few weeks before the new Kara took over, as a surprisingly, a surprisingly tranquil. Maybe Tommy and I were masking a special effort. To be nice to each other, but the time seemed to slip by in an almost carefree way. You might think there would have been an air of unreality about us being like that, but it didn't seem strange at that time. I was quite busy with a couple of my other donors at, in North Wales, and that kept me from Kingsville more than I, I, I would have wanted. But I still managed to come three or four times a week. The, the weather grew colder, but stayed dry and Stay dry and often sunny, and while, and, and we while away the hours in his room, sometimes having sex more often than talking, or with Tommy listening to me read. Once or twice, Tommy would brought out his little notebook and doodle away for new animal ideas when when I read from the bed. 
Then I came in one day, and it was the last time. I arrived just after one o'clock on a crisp December afternoon. I went up to his room, half expecting some change. I don't know what. Maybe I thought he had he had put up decorations in his room or something. But of course, everything was normal, and all in all, that that was a relief. Tommy didn't look any different either. But we were. But we started talking. It was hard to pretend this was all just another visit. Then again, we had talked over so much in the previous weeks. It wasn't as though we had anything in particular we had to get through. And I think we were reluctant to start any any new conversation. We had, we would regret not be able to finish properly, and that's why there was this kind of emptiness to our talk that day. Just once. Though after I had been wandering aimlessly around his room for a while, I asked him, "Tommy, are you glad Ruth completed before finding out everything we did in the end?" He was lying on his bed, and went on staring in the ceiling for a while before saying, "Funny, I was just thinking about the same thing the other day. What you have got to remember about Ruth, when it comes to things like that, she is always different to us. You and me, right from the start." Even when we were little, we were always trying to find things out. Remember, Kath, all those secret talks we used to have. But Ruth wasn't like that. She always wanted to believe in things. That was Ruth. So yeah, in a way, I think it's best it had the way it happened. Then he added, "Of course, what we found out, Miss Emily, all of that, it doesn't change anything about Ruth. She wanted the best for us at the end, and she really wanted the best for us." I didn't want to get into big discussion about Ruth at that stage, so I just agreed with him. But now I've I've had more time to think about it. I'm not sure how I feel. A part of me keeps wishing that we had somehow been able to share everything we discovered about Ruth. Okay, maybe it would have made her feel bad, made her see whatever damage that she had done once done so it couldn't be repaired easily as she had hoped. And maybe if I'm compl- I'm completely honest, there's a small part of me wishing that she knew it all before she completed. But in the end, I think it was something else, something much more than my feeling vengeful and mean spirited. Because Tommy said that she wanted the best for us in the end, and though she said that day in the car, I have never, I would never forgive her. She was wrong about that. I have got no anger left for her now. When I say I wish she had found out the whole se- the score, the whole score, it's more because I feel sad at the idea of her finishing up in different from me and Tommy. The way it it is, it's like there's a line with us on one side and Ruth is on the other. And when all said and done, I feel sad about that, and I think she too she would too if she could see it. Tommy and I. We didn't do a big farewell number that day. When it was time, he came downstairs with me, which he didn't usually do, and we walked across the square together to the car. Because of the time of the year, the sun was already setting behind the buildings. There was a few shadowy figures, as usual, under the overhanging roof, but the square itself was empty. Tommy was silent all the way to the car. Then he did a little laugh and said, "You know, Cass." When I used to play football, back at Hailsham, I had this secret thing I did. When I scored a goal, I would turn around like this. He raised his both of his arms in triumph, and I ran back to my mates. I never went mad or anything; just ran back with my arms up like this. He paused for a moment, his arms still in the air. Then he lowered them back and smiled. In my head, cast. When I was running back, I always imagined that I was splashing through water, nothing deep, just about above, just up to the ankles at the most. That's what I used to imagine every time. Splash, splash, splash. He put his arms again. He put his arms up again. It felt really good. You have just scored. You turn and then splash, splash, splash. He looked at me and did another laugh. All this time. I never told a single soul. I laughed too and said, "You're a crazy kid, Tommy." After that, we kissed, just a small kiss. Then I got into the car. 
Tommy kept standing there while I turned the thing around. Then as I pulled away, he smiled and waved. I watched him in, the rear, in my rear view, rear view mirror. He smiled and waved. Sorry, I watched him in my rear view mirror. And he was standing there almost till the last moment. Right at the end, I saw him raise his hand vaguely and turn towards the overhanging roof. Then the square had gone from the mirror. I was talking to one of my donors a few days ago who was complaining about how memories, even your most precious one, fade surprisingly quickly. But I don't go along with that. The memories I value most, I don't see them ever fading. I lost Ruth, then I lost Tommy, but I won't lose my memories with them. I suppose I lost Hailsham too. You still hear stories about some ex Hailsham students trying to get, trying to find it, or rather, the place where it used to be. And the odd rumor will go around sometimes about what Hailsham has become these days. A hotel, a school, a ruin. Myself, for all the driving I do, I've never tried to find it. I'm not really interested in seeing it, whatever way it is right now. Mind you, though, I say I never go looking for Hailsham. What I find is that sometimes when I'm driving around, I suddenly think I've spotted a bit of it. I see a sports pavilion in the distance and I was sure that it's ours or a row of poplars on the horizon next to the woolly oak and I'm convinced for a second that I'm coming up to the south playing field from the other side. Once on a grey morning on a long stretch of road in Gloucestershire, I passed a broken down car in Layby and I was sure the girl standing in front of it gazing emptily towards out towards the oncoming vehicles was Susanna C, who had been a couple years above us and one of the sales monitors. There are moments that hit me when I'm least expecting it, when I'm driving with something else entirely in my mind. So maybe at some level, I am on the lookout for Hailsham. But as I say, I don't go searching for it. And anyway, by the end of the year, I won't be driving around like this anymore. So the chances are I won't ever come across it now. And on reflection, I'm glad that it's the way it will be. It's like my memories of Tommy and Ruth. Once I'm able to have a quieter life, in whichever center they'll send me to, I'll have Hailsham with me, safely in my head. And that's something that no one can take away. The only indulgent thing I did, just once, was a couple of weeks after I heard Tommy had completed, when I drove up to, drove up to Norfolk. Even though I had no ne real need to go, I wasn't after anything in particular, and I didn't go up as far as the coast. Maybe j I just felt like looking at all those flat fields of nothing and the huge grey sky. At one stage, I found myself on the road that I have never been on. And for about half an hour, I didn't know where I was and I didn't care. I went past that field after the flat fe featureless field with virtually no change except for the occasionally flock of birds. Hearing my engines flew out of the furrows. Then at last, I spotted a few trees in the distance and not far from the roadside. So I drove up to them and stopped and got out. I found I was standing before the acres of plow earth plowed earth. There was a fence keeping me from stepping into the field with two lines of barbed wires. And I could see how this fence and the clusters of three or four trees three or four trees above me were the only things breaking the wind for miles. Along the fence, especially along the lower lines of the wires, all sort of rubbish had caught and tangled. It was like the debris you get on seashore. The wind must have carried some of it, some of it for miles and miles before they, before coming up against these trees and these two lines of barbed wires up in the branches of the trees too. I could see flapping about torn plastic sheeting and bits of old carrier bags. That was the only time as I stood there, looking at the strange rubbish, feeling the wind coming across those empty fields. I started to imagine just a little fantasy thing because this was Norfolk after all 
and it was only a couple of weeks since I had lost him. I was thinking about the rubbish, the flapping plastics in the branches, the shoreline of odd stuff caught along the fence, and I half closed my eyes and imagined this was the spot where everything I had lost since my childhood had washed up. And I was now standing here in front of it, and if I waited long enough, a tiny figure would appear in the horizon of the field, across the field, and gradually get larger until I see that it was Tommy, and he, had, and he would wave, maybe even call. The fantasy never get beyond that, because I didn't let it. And though, and though the tears rolled down my face, I wasn't sobbing or out of control. I just waited a bit, then turned back to the car and to drive off wherever it was I was supposed to be. And that is the end of Never Let Me Go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for listening. I'm so sorry it took me two weeks to get to part three, but we are finally done with the book. It's a great, great, great story. I don't know how much you guys understood it, but yeah. Oh, I woke up so early this morning. Miracle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chicken Nog. Thank you. Thank you for listening. It's a great read. I love it. I love this book. I've I've read it and reread it so many times. It's insane. <laughs> it's a great book. I love it. Thank you, Dian, for being here. For hanging out with me while I'm reading. Thank you to listeners in the stream. I see that there are six of you. Uh, I'm not sure where you guys are from, but thank you for listening. I really, I really appreciate it. I hope I did the book justice. Uh, my pronunciation is shit, and there were many like British country names that's like countries like like cities, town names that's like really difficult for me to pronounce <laughs> they are really difficult for me to pronounce um, but I try my best um, I'm sorry if I butchered it <laughs> uh, I'm not yeah the English is my second language I always tell people when I fuck up my English <laughs> so yeah thank you so much I got a bit sad at the end it's a very sad ending yeah it's um it the ending is pretty great. Uh but I highly recommend you all to watch the movie Never Let Me Go 2010. Uh The last line of the movie is really really good. <laughs> uh, I remember that very well. When it was like spoken, the spoken last spoken line of the movie is really really good. I recommend everyone to watch it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nugget, for making it here. Thank you, Dean. Yeah, have a seen you in a bit, Chicken Nugget. <sighs> All right. Without further ado, I'm gonna end my stream here today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys uh, next week. Uh, we'll be reading a new book, but I won't tell you what book it is yet because I'm still deciding if I should read that. Oh, oh, oh. no! I'm done. Uh, Starlight. I just finished. 
No! No! I just... I, I was just done! Oh no! Uh, you, you have to watch the VOD <laughs> for the part 3 <laughs> Cause I just finished Yeah, yeah, yeah part 3, part 3, I fin yeah I, I had part 3 left and I finished part 3 already So the whole book is done <laughs> I was going to end my stream and just popped in, oh no You have to rewatch the VOD I'll I'll put it up on YouTube and everything. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I felt like I should have told you earlier, but I, I kind of like forgot. I was like, it was like yesterday. I just suddenly felt like, oh god, I gotta finish up the books. I have like, I have pushed back part three like for like two three weeks already. So yeah. Yeah, watch it on YouTube because it's like the load is is loading. The loading is easier on YouTube. The loading on 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 Twitch sometimes is like a bit weird. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I should have somehow alerted you. Yeah, but yeah, thank you so much, guys. Uh, I really gotta go. I'm hungry. I'm gonna see you guys soon. Next week, next week. Uh, I don't know. I don't wanna promise to be honest. I don't wanna. Oh, thank you. I don't wanna promise, but I will see you guys next week. Um, we are going to read a new. Oh my god! No, no, no! Don't give me things. Don't give me things. I'm okay. <laughs> I'll I'll eat my bagel or something. <laughs> I should, I should learn how to make bagel myself. Honestly, so I don't have to waste so much money like just paying for bagels. Um. Anyway, thank you. I'm gonna see you guys soon. Uh, yeah. One of these days, I'll have to stream my P9S pork because I really want to clear it. But I'll see. <laughs> thank you. Oh my god, there are more and more people coming in. Okay. Yay. People on my stream. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for dropping by to uh, Ariana Luna's channel. I am Ariana Luna. Uh, I play. Uh, in the Tomberry server, um, in uh, Final Fantasy fourteen, uh, uh, occasionally I will do reading sessions. Uh, I mean, it used to be like a weekly thing, <laughs> but I haven't been consistent because I'm like really tired and all. Um, anyway, I do a reading session called Nudibles, which is a play on word on Audible plus my name, Ariana Nuna. Uh, people usually call me Nuna in game. Um, I basically just choose a book that I like or a, a book that I haven't read before and I'll read a few chapters a day and I'll usually read about three days per week two to three days per week or something like that yeah uh, I have kind of chosen my next book but I can't I don't want to promise anything first but yeah you guys will see my next stream coming up uh, follow me on Twitter and Join my Discord for alert whenever I go live. Uh, if you want, I mean, I, you don't have to. But um, thank you for watching today. I really appreciate all of you, and I'll see you guys soon. Uh, have a great day. Uh, have a great week. A uh, great day. I hope you guys have an interesting Wednesday. Usually Wednesday is very boring. It's like in the middle of the week. Anyway, uh, I'll see you guys soon. Uh, I will also stream some other game play in this game, maybe raiding. I don't know. I'll see you guys. Thank you. Bye. I gotta go and eat. Bye. Oh, wait, wait. I forgot to send you off my favorite song in the world. Here you go. Have you ever had a dream that, 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 that you, you, you can know? Hell yeah. Let's go. Thank you so much. I love you guys. Bye.